What's up guys? It's yo boy on the sensei. Welcome to a new series, Star Wars, Reborn as Anakin Skywalker, Part 3. Like, share, and comment on the video. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already subscribed. Also, remember to check out the original story, link in the description. Consider joining my Patreon to support the channel. With all that out of the way, let's get into it. Anakin wanted to cooperate further with the Kaminans, especially after the good job they had done. The problem with his living droids was starting to become more and more prominent, and the only droid that was alive that did not have this problem was HK-47. What he had in mind was the transference of the living droid's consciousness into a new body, one that was biologically living, and not reliant on the force to keep them alive. This lead down the path of merging man and machine, synthetic beings made and genetically modified to live like a normal life form. The only things is that the living droids may lose out on their ability to use the force, because their problem had to do with midi-chlorians. The transfer of consciousness of the soul would be extremely hard to achieve if they were normal living biological base beings. For Anakin because of their machine nature, it makes it all the easier for him to accomplish the impossibility of immortality. Sadly because of their nature, they would continue to exist no doubt. And if they died, they could just insert themselves into another pre-made body. The droids should be rewarded after everything they have done for him, and it is only right that I help them extend their lifespan indefinitely. What would happen was that their synthetic bodies would be exchangeable, kind of like altered carbon, where the chip that stores their consciousness, their soul could go into new bodies. This is the benefit of the droids becoming synthetic. My Emperor, I would like to report. The mental connection had opened up giving way to a conversation between Anakin and HK-47. Report. We have gone to the system and planet you wanted us to go to, and have been able to locate minimal parts from the Star Forge. Continue. Most of everything we have found so far were the closest to the island we currently inhabit. The sea is vast, and the area we have landed on indicates higher levels of metal alloys, thus making it highly likely this is the area where the Star Forge crashed. Casualties. No casualties are to be reported, as what has happened so far is only minor expeditions into the sea that were not too deep, but I expect a greater number of losers going by the calculations so far. Assessment on the damaged parts so far. Our analysis has detected the cause of destruction was from some type of high caliber explosion, and the other damage present is from the impact and atmosphere changes upon re-entry. Cost to benefit analysis. From what was analyzed the benefits still outweigh the cost, if it can be properly rebuilt. My emperor, if I may suggest, go on. I would like an increase in manpower. Considering the scale of the operation would it not be best to send more droids to accelerate the process? Agreed. I will send more droids your way. But it will take time to get them all, considering that they would have to get there covertly. Thank you Emperor. You may go now. HK-47 cut the mental communication between the two with haste to get back to his work, and as soon as it was given leave by its Emperor. Back to the topic at hand, Anakin wanted to recreate the living droids by transplanting their souls, their consciousness into a synthetic form, that would be a mesh of the best of both worlds. It would be human-based, what they would get was the standard human baseline build, but with a twist. The bodies would be grown from scratch, and would go through the same process he is doing to himself now. I can't be having my droids be put into inferior bodies, now can I? Even if they would lose their potential within the Force, at least they would live and have superior physical forms. Another thing about the previous created for his now dubbed Sky Seed, was that it was only meant to be compatible for humans, specifically human males. Anakin had decided that if he wanted to create synthetic beings, he would not want to limit them to only the bodies of men, but would grant them choice, even if limited to humans. In the future, the Sky Seed may develop some variations for other species and their physiologies. But for now I will have to keep it simple, at least as simple as this process can be. Anakin thinks to himself, who knows, maybe because of my high midi chlorine count, it would also inadvertently increase the force sensitivity for the sense once implanted. Within the Jedi High Council's special meeting room, a lot of people had come and converged in towards this spot to discuss some things. Things in particular related to the Chosen One Anakin Skywalker, their discoveries about what had happened on Tatooine from the start, did not reveal anything to Damning, but after further rumors and investigation, they had come to the information exposed to the public about Anakin's status as some sort of prince. Other weird happenings had been going on as well, like the shift within the Force they felt very recently, but they could not connect that to Anakin, nor would they considering its dark nature. Call you all, today I have, Master Yoda spoke as everyone had gathered and taken their respective seats. There were the Jedi Masters, Yoda, Yaddle, Yero Poof, Coleman Treba, even Peel, Ethkoth, Kai Adi Mundi, Deepa Balaba, Adi Gallia, Mace Windu, Plo Koon, and CC Tyan. Some old and some new faces were present among the bunch. Qui Gong was also present, but instead of having a seat, he has to stand in the center amongst the seated masters. Master Yoda, what is this about? 
Mace had asked the diminutive green alien. About, young Skywalker, it is. Deeper Balaba speaks her mind. It would seem the apprentice, the chosen one has gotten somewhat of a cult following back on his homeworld. I have become aware of this. Qui-Gon responded. I as well have become aware. Mace also replies. Something to do with the rebellion, perhaps. Yoda spoke with humming to himself. Everyone had become enlightened to the actions taken by Anakin, and not a lot of them liked it. But it did not go against the cause for peace, considering all he did was help indirectly, by providing aid and being compassionate. What they did not like was the clear disobedience to their instructions, but also how he did not fully commit to and follow the code. Perhaps Padawan Skywalker needs some lessons to do with the code again. Plo Kun added, has he not been fully briefed on what is expected of him? Kai Adi Mundi spoke, murmurs broke out among and around as everyone engaged with their own thoughts, their own opinions and interpretations of what had happened, the events that took place definitely seemed to shake the course of peace. Qui-Gon decides to clear any doubt. I am assuming that this is not about that incident again. Surely everyone here must know that Anakin did nothing more, nothing less when it came to that situation. Mace was quick to jump on Qui-Gon's bandwagon. This is true. Besides the point, he has already been punished because of this, and will be much more severely punished should any future action like this is to take place. Mace was both serious, and not because he has grown attached to the boy, even though attachments are not allowed it still happens. What were the Jedi to expect? That two people, master and student who will spend a lot of time together, would not start to develop some type of relationship. Father to son, mother to daughter, brother to sister, sister to brother, would it not happen? Correct, you are his status. The matter now is, Yoda says. Mace chooses to question what Yoda meant. What do you mean by that Grandmaster? Everyone else grows to a still silence awaiting what the wise and very old Jedi has to say. All possessions, all worldly things, given up, they must be. Yoda then continues. The Jedi Code, this is. Complicate, this could the situation. I assure you Master Yoda, that my young apprentice would not be using his new title to his advantage. Qui-Gon says not knowing Anakin had already used it to his advantage plenty of times. After a short discussion, the only logical conclusion is that it would not affect Anakin's development, because he had already given up these sorts of things ages ago. His punishment was already done, but some could see some favoritism when dishing out the punishment. But hey, that is just how life goes sometimes. While someone may have been confined to the Jedi Temple longer, or maybe even kicked out of the order, Anakin was thrown to help teach children his age and younger. Connections may very well be more powerful than money itself. More to speak of, we do. Before anyone could finish or leave, Yoda had decided to speak again. Kai Adi Mundi replies with a questioning tone. Master Yoda, what more is there to speak of? Everyone, leave, they may. Jedi Master, Qui-Gon and Master Mace, stay, they must. After saying that, everyone starts to leave as they the three get to their next discussion. What they discuss next was kept secret from everyone else until it was revealed as to why they had discussed things by themselves. Padawan Skywalker, disappointed, we are. Yoda says to Anakin, while Qui-Gon and Mace are in attendance. Actions, you may take. Younglings, learn properly, they must. Your methods, exemplarily, they are not. I apologize, Master. But I did what I believed was best for the younglings to learn about. Anakin replied, The Jedi Code, you must teach. You must abide by. Yoda said, Master Yoda, if I may excuse myself for a moment. I believe that we have not called my apprentice here to talk about his teaching methodology. Qui-Gon intervenes. Yes, correct, you are? No, here to discuss the Padawan Skywalker's first mission. Yoda said. Anakin interrupts to ask his question at the top of his mind. Mission, I will finally be having a mission on my own. Of course, I also assume I will be traveling with one of my masters to the mission we are to go on. That is true, Padawan Skywalker. Yoda said. It has been long overdue that you would start and accompany one of us, so you would gain experience out there to truly see what the Jedi are meant to do. Mace spoke in this moment. Humming Yoda tells Anakin of the mission and tells the two masters to decide who would take this upon themselves. Generally Anakin should go with Qui-Gon because Qui-Gon is considered his main master. He was after all the one to suggest training him. But Mace is also Anakin's master. I have responsibilities here for now. So I suggest the apprentice go with Jedi Master Qui-Gon. A sound decision. But is that what you want, Master Windu? Yoda asks. Yes, there should be many more opportunities for me too in the future go on. And I believe I know of what task you two are to be sent on. Mace continued. This should be something simple and basic enough to kickstart everything you are to learn. It may even humble you a bit. Mace smirked at his own comment before it went away from his face. He obviously was referring to the times that now Anakin had now gained the upper hand in their duels, their trainings with the Saber, meaning that Anakin has now surpassed him in skill. Also taking into account Anakin's physical prowess. There was no way for Mace to properly defend against Anakin in a war of attrition. Mace may still have more battle experience, and it had shown when they sparred in combat through dueling, 
because despite Anakin's edge, he would not be able to win against him with his skills and strength alone. Though Mace supposed that if he did not use the Force to help him out in the later sessions they had held, he may have very well beat him. I think everyone is forgetting something. Anakin trailed off. What might that be, my young apprentice? Qui-Gon decides to ask the question to Anakin's statement. I have yet to construct my lightsaber, my very own saber meant to represent and symbolize myself and my very presence within the Force. Anakin then continued, Do I not need to also fully complete the initiate trials as well? I think you have proven yourself to be very capable with the use of the Force and within other areas as well. That include the teachings of the Jedi. But it is true that you would need to go through a specific process to get and construct your saber. Qui-Gon says, If it is anything like my own, then it would be a lengthy process. So you may not be able to go on this mission. Mace says reminiscing about his days as a youngling himself. Jedi initiates practice with training lightsabers until they crafted their own in the caves of Ilum. And Anakin had up until this point, had been using one such saber to practice and train with. He did not have the time to create a secret weapon of his own. But that was mainly because he wanted to wait. Patience was key to a lot of things. And if he speed the process up too much, he would be incapable of truly bringing out the best saber for himself. Then, Padawan Skywalker. Wait you must, next until, Ilum's crystal caves, initiates her to go. Yoda said, yes, master. Anakin replied. And so just like that, Anakin had been given his first potential mission, of course he would have to go with another, in particular it would seem quite gone. But he was not too fussed about it, considering he would finally be able to create his own lightsaber. The many designs, utilities and extra functions that he could add onto the saber itself was an exciting prospect for himself. To Ilum we must go, Yoda states. Ilum. Ilum was an ice planet in the unknown regions, one of the main sources of the valuable Adagan crystals used in the construction of Jedi lightsabers. The caverns containing the crystals were long ago turned into a Jedi temple. Unlike the crystals of other planets, the crystals of Ilum were limited to blue, green and purple in color. The planet was over 90% covered by ice. You have proved to be the top of your class, and so now is the time of the gathering. For someone, no anyone whom is for so sensitive, there is no greater challenge or honor. Anakin spoke to a bunch of children around a year older than himself, but he was much bigger and taller towering over them. The gathering was a part of the training process of the Jedi Order, which also served as a rite of passage for Jedi initiates prior to their beginning training as a Padawan learner. It was established at the beginning of the Jedi Order, and was preserved into the time of the present. The gathering was an exercise which took place on the ancient Jedi world island. A group of Jedi initiates would be transported to the frozen world to claim their lightsaber crystals for the first time. The process was a lesson to teach the young Jedi to overcome their own personal fears or failings. Everyone was currently within a ship that was landed on the icy frozen planet, staying within until the snowstorm blocking their way forward settles down. Arrived, we have. Yoda says to the group that had come to complete their initiation along with Anakin, whom did not need to, but was here to get his lightsaber's core, a crystal. Others in attendance included Jedi Master's Mace Windu and Shark T. Jedi Master Kwai Gong was not here because he was setting himself up for the mission to come. Usually only one Jedi of higher rank would come to and help the initiates, but this time it was a special case involving Anakin. Everyone had someone to talk to, Yoda was minding his own business, sometimes having her initiate approach him. Mace was talking with some of their younglings because of his reputation, and other younglings here to get their own lightsabers also had their own groups. The only real person left out to wait out the storm was Anakin, because he hardly knew anyone in this age group. In fact, he did not mingle much with other members within the Order. Now only this, he saw most other children his age even a few years older than him as annoying. He is basically an already developed being his character, his personality, and would be troubled by the unstable emotions of the children. Thankfully they had been taught and reinforced with the Jedi Code's mindset which made interactions much more tolerable. Padawan Skywalker, Jedi Master, Shark T had approached him as it would seem she had no one to interact with. Master T, Anakin greeted back, It would seem that you do not have many friends here. That is because of the difference between myself and the others. Difference. What difference do you see? Humming to himself much like Yoda, Anakin then responds. Maturity in both the physical and mental aspects. Level of knowledge and the application of that knowledge. Interesting way to look at your peers. Shark T raises her non-existent eyebrows. Surely you are not suggesting that I am the same as them. No, you are different. So much so different that I would not have expected something anything less when you were given leeway. She continued. Mind you, I am also not much for communication. A powerful Togruta female. Master Shark T's nature was notably different from her heritage at times. Though Togruta were a communal species, T was highly independent and preferred to operate alone. Yes, I have heard of your reclusiveness. My reputation precedes me. Shark replies in jest. Anakin deciding to stay away from the topic of her apprentice, knowing that her first apprentice had died, asks a question. Why have you come on this trip? Let's just say, is that I have a vested interest on what will go on here. Deciding now that this would be the best time to throw caution to the wind, he asks. Are you here for your second apprentice? 
She grows a bit silent at the question before responding. Yes, the girl over there. Fei Sun is her name. She points to her Padawan to be, except Fei Sun herself does not know she is to be accepted. So you have decided to stalk your target, have you? Not showing any embarrassment, Shark T responds. In fact, I have. With a smile on her face, she asks Anakin a question herself her naturally pointed teeth showing. You have come for your own crystal as well, to shape your very own saber. Yes, I have. Looking him up and down, her smile becomes a bit predatory. It looks to me that you already have a saber of quite the caliber. And what would you mean by that? Anakin replies with a slightly surprised tone not expecting the joke. I am sure you know what I mean by that young Padawan Skywalker. Deciding not to comment and move on to another topic because the conversation was turning a bit awkward. Is it her instincts kicking in? I did not know that she would act this way. Highly amused he begins to speak again. Right. Moving on from that topic I am sure that you have better things to do right now. No, not really. I just thought it would be fun to come and mess around with you. You mean that in the joking sense, right? Yes, I jest. Hesitantly Anakin replies, Okay, don't get me wrong, she is quite the looker. But does no one else find it weird that she was coming onto me so strongly? Weirdly strong. Anakin thinks to himself at the strange occurrence. As everyone continues to pass the time, the snowstorm starts to settle down, that it is not quite over yet. Anakin and Shark T begin to talk about many things after the initial conversation and found they could connect over lightsaber combat. Even though they could not spar or duel with each other here, given what everyone is here for and their being to room, they could only rely on their speaking skills to debate with one another. With a subtle sense of humor, Master T sometimes seemed cold and unfeeling, something that was not helped by her naturally pointed teeth which, when bared, appeared as a sinister snarl. Thankfully it did not take away from her appeal. It may even add appeal for certain people whom were into that sort of thing. Despite being trained as a Jedi Consular, T's reputation with a lightsaber was well known throughout the Order. Regardless of her reputation, T remained humble and preferred to spar with words rather than her lightsaber. Ended, the storm has. Everyone, begin their journey, they may. Yoda spoke out loud for everyone to hear, given that it was quite noisy within, even after the storm had calmed down. Everyone begins to disembark and continue on their journey to the Crystal Caves of Ilum. The gathering began with a group of Jedi initiates being transported to one of the few worlds where lightsaber crystals could be found, often the Ice World Ilum, by a Jedi of a higher rank. Once on Ilum, the Jedi traveled together to the entrance of the ancient Jedi Temple, located at the mouth of the Crystal Caves. At the entrance to the temple, the group of young Jedi would endure their first test of skill. Their guide would direct the group to focus their concentration on the Force, that only their combined efforts would be able to open the sealed entrance to the temple. Now that everyone is here, first things first is that your safety and the safety of your pairs should come above all else. Shark T announced to the group of expectant initiates. Shark T was all about safety considering her training methods. But that was besides the event that was happening. Anakin thinks to himself knowing of what would happen and has happened due to her nature of being extremely isolated. Mace spoke up right after Shark T. Yes, everyone here should listen to the words of advice given by Master T. Follow it. Follow the code and trust in the force, everything should be okay. Who will be a guide? Well their guide Anakin was to participate with the rest of the group, even though he could probably do it himself. But the point of the exercise is teamwork. Teamwork makes the dream work right. Begin Will, your first test. Yoda says to the expectant initiates, I shall be your guide for the rest of your trials to come. T speaks up about her position for this trip. Everyone then travels towards the entrance of the caves. Here you all will have to trust in yourselves, each other, and your connection to the Force to help you open up this sealed entrance. Murmurs are spoken in hushed tones with the children undoubtedly worried about what is to happen. Thoughts such as, will it work? I might let everyone else down and many other examples, as at the very first test the insecurities of the children are put on full display. And Anakin could see through them all. The best and the brightest but in the end still developing children. The weight of expectation surely pressures them. Only through your Combine's efforts will be able to move the entrance to open the seal. And will you then begin your journey onto becoming a true Jedi? Shark T encourages with some positive reinforcement. Encouraged, as if they had been buffed by some support class. Some got right into the action. Delving deep into their connection they poured upon the immense cosmic power at their fingertips, and together tried to unseal the entrance. The temple door slowly started to unravel itself as Shark T continuously provides the buffer, but did not help other than through words alone. Deciding to move things along, Anakin started to give them another boost to their adrenaline and dopamine to increase the chances of participation. This event is not for myself, but for the others. Some students here needed some proper characters development. Everyone finally put in the effort and succeeded, with a little help from Anakin, and the encouragement from T. Great. 
With a smile on her face that scared a few of them, she continued, Now that you all have passed your first test, we should head inside. The first to enter the Jedi Temple was T, followed by Anakin. The others followed soon after now excited and astonished at their accomplishment so far. Everyone followed after Master Shark T, as her experience and Force signature would be the beacon for everyone to follow. She had after all come down here a few times herself and traversed the illustrious caves. Following this, the group of younglings were required to descend into the catacombs of the Crystal Caves in order to search out the lightsaber crystal, which would become theirs. So too would Anakin have to delve deep into the catacombs. Now that we have arrived, I must warn you all that what comes next will be another test. T says before continuing, You all will only have a limited amount of time in which to search for your crystals, as the entrance would freeze shut with the setting of this planet's star. This sobered up some of the children drunk on the high of passing the first test. Too bad I know that the supposed frozen entrance is nothing but a trick. Quite cruel to do to children, but that is the way of the Jedi. Now if you do not hurry along, your time is running out, and you would not want to be stuck down here forever. Now would you? T incentivizes. The children rapidly push themselves into the catacombs, but Anakin stays behind to talk with Shark T for a bit before heading in, knowing he has all the time in the galaxy. Master T, if I may, I have some questions to ask you. Go ahead, but I suggest you make this quick, your time is running out. Curious, she replied. I was wondering about your rank as a Jedi Master among some other things. What about my rank? The rank of Master was bestowed upon very few knights in every generation. As such, Masters made up the smallest percent of the Order's membership. The most common path to this rank was to train and elevate several Padawans to the rank of Knight, typically one right after the other, and have them all successfully pass their Jedi trials. It seems that you have achieved your rank pretty young, if I do say so myself. Smart on you for not having to ask of my age. T quips back knowing that this was Anakin's real question. True, I did not want to know in particular what you had done to get where you are now, but your age. Never ask a woman's age, this only applies to people 30 years and older in general. But with her, I cannot tell. Anakin sighs mentally. What is your age now? She asks Anakin first. Well, that is complicated. But right now I am 11 years of age turning 12 this year. I am 10 years older than you are. Born 21 years ago on my homeworld of Shiley. This makes me the human age equivalent of 21. Thanks for answering my question. I best be heading off now then. Anakin zooms off into the catacombs to look for his very own crystal or crystals. Weird question, but okay T thinks to herself about the strangeness that had just occurred. Now to wait for when everyone succeeds, or inevitably fails. There is no emotion, there is peace. There is no ignorance, there is knowledge. There is no passion, there is serenity. There is no chaos, there is harmony. There is no death, there is the force. The Jedi Code. Peace is a lie, there is only passion. Through passion, I gain strength. Through strength, I gain power. Through power, I gain victory. Through victory my chains are broken. The Force shall free me. The Sith Code. Both codes fundamentally flawed in their own ways with them not complete, both lacking in certain areas, will be put to the test. Anakin was walking through the catacombs drawing nearer to the location he was destined to go towards, of course. That destination was in more than one direction. He felt it. He felt the force call out to him from all corners of the cave, signaling to him that every single crystal here would accept him. What he was looking for however was the call that resounded and yelled the loudest for his attention, because that would be the one with the best potential, raw potential that is. He was looking for more than that though. So he had to go deeper, because if raw strength was what he was looking for alone, he would have taken many crystals, and tried to experiment by combining multiple into a new singular overpowered crystal. As he was traversing the underground he started to hear things. Not unlike the voices heard back on Coruscant when going towards the shrine underneath, the Sith Temple of all things. Here in the crystal caves to get his own lightsaber crystal strange happenings were taking place. There is no emotion, there is peace. A vague figure on the right appeared next to him as he traveled. Peace is a lie, there is only passion. Another figure on his left also appeared before him. There is no ignorance, there is knowledge. The one on the right started to become much more clear, cloaked in a blue luminous hue. Through passion, I gained strength. The one on the left also became more clear taking on a red hue. It was him, he was both of the figures, while one was blue the other was red, both representing either side of the force. Their alignments clear to him that they both represent the light and the dark. Other versions of him, his future is either the Sith Vader or the Jedi Anakin, both with their own differences but it was clear it was him. Blue Anakin continues. There is no passion, there is serenity. Red Vader continues. Through strength, I gain power. The echoes throughout the cave called out to him. The crystals and the force were telling him to choose. To choose his fate, his side, his alignment. Anakin was not prone to getting these sorts of things, but it had happened on occasion because of who he is, or what he could have been, but this was becoming more frequent. His search for a proper balance between the sides was kind of driving him mad. There is no chaos, there is harmony. Blue Anakin says as he continues. Through power, I gain victory. Red Anakin continues. 
There is no death, there is the force. Blue Anakin finishes. Red Anakin also finishes. Through victory my chains are broken. The force shall free me. Why are you two reciting the lines from the codes? Anakin finally decides to address the issue at hand. We are here as representations. Blue Anakin says. Representations of you. Who you are and what you could be. Red Anakin states. You know why you are here, and why we have appeared to you. I have an idea. So are you two here to antagonize me? Help me in some way or to convince me that one side is better than the other. Everything. Both Red and Blue said simultaneously. You have created life, and in response the Force had taken that life away. By making sure they die slowly. Blue said. That is the way of the Sith to be masters of their own destiny. To be the master of the Force itself, is that what you are? Are you me? Red said. I think I will just ignore you two for now. You cannot, we are you. You must not ignore oneself. Blue said. To know oneself is to know your weaknesses. Your strengths and with it you can evolve. Become better than you are. Truly you are passionate in the search for perfection. Red said. The crystal still continuously resonates calling out to Anakin while he is being pestered. You have been torn, conflicted, but serenity is within you. You have peace. Blue said. Red continued. But you are still torn between the fight. The fight that will determine the fate of the galaxy. And I say stuff them. Who are they to need you? How weak. The weak shall be purged. Blue then said. Compassion is the Jedi way. You have followed this so well. I am my own person. Neither of the two of you will convince me that one side is better than the other. Anakin argued. We are in your head we can see. Your defenses and ability to hide your mind from any and everyone will not stop us from seeing what you think. Red said. Dominant are your thoughts of greed and lust a result of the ritual you had done years ago. Misguided perhaps you were. Blue says. I disagree. How will you achieve balance then? When your being is much more aligned with the dark side. Blue questions. You have a point and I do not have a solution right now in the future one will present itself to me. And if one does not, then I shall make one. Yes. Master of yourself, your destiny, your freedom from everything. The dark side is powerful within you. Red laws. It is just sad and angering you know nothing of the dark despite your intrigue. You have not truly delved into the powers granted by this alignment. I have no time and right now I am focused on soaking up everything that has to do with the Jedi. After this I would leave to pursue the dark side and its fast powers. I advise you against this decision. Blue says content in my decision. I am content. Are you not ambitious by nature? Your greed and possessiveness will lead you down blue advisors. Yes. Yes. I know the dark side. Can you calm down blue me? You are distracting me from finding my crystal. Anakin continued deeper and deeper, getting closer to the planet's core, step by step. Crystals don't form just because they can. They form in a combination of the planet's natural elements, together with the strong connection to the Force. Usually there are meanings to the way one's own Force energy interacts with their chosen crystal. Or is it the one chooses the wizard? I mean, is it the crystal that chooses the Force sensitive? Truly there are many sources that could be used to create a lightsaber, with many kinds giving unique or special traits to the saber. Not knowing how long he had been underground, Anakin brings up his interface HUD connected to his mind though the nano suit. Seems to still be within the time frame to get the crystal. Anakin thinks to himself. Quite literally Anakin had decided to start calling his temporary companions red and blue, not really caring for their complaints. They are him after all, so why wouldn't they try to joke around? The both had been what some would call the angel on the right and the devil on the left, linking back to the idea of the light and dark being synonymous with dualities. Light and dark, left and right, up and down, black and white, red and blue, yin and yang. George Lucas had originally gotten the concept for the Force from this concept, the concept of yin and yang. The Jedi were glorified space monks capable of using magic. Or had it been Lucas had an in-depth look into what could happen in an alternative reality of the universe he currently reside in. It could be he was wrong all along. Because he had even said the Jedi were the good guys. But they were and are obviously flawed. One extreme does not mean you have achieved balance. And in fact the Force, Light and Dark are a part of that balance. The concept of the Dark cannot exist without the Light. The Light cannot exist with the Dark. It goes both ways. Subsisting off of each other. That is the way it works. Anakin's thoughts start to travel to other things as he continues his long trek. Now that I have two hearts does that make me a Time Lord? Thoughts like this as you could see, he was using to help him pass the time. He also used some of his extra thought processes to look into how Tatooine was developing and the business that was still thriving, which lead to him thoroughly looking through everything. What if I created some type of virtual reality? It could be used to test out the development of my ability to merge flesh and machine, but also be the start of how I could create that matrix I have been working on. Coming to a halt, Anakin feels something from deep within, while his two specters watch on from behind him. He has finally found it has he. Blue questions out loud. It was about time, with the upgrades he has done to his fleshy self. I would have hoped he would be faster. Red said. Anakin now in a trance, moves over to a specific crystal. But it is on top of the cave's roof, stuck in between some rocks shining out and giving off a luminescent glow. 
but it was different from the rest. Within the Force, its power was more potent, its potential called out to Anakin none alike the rest as he stared at it. Starting to float off of the ground, he ascends. Grasping the crystal he starts to come back down after his little venture to the top of the deep underground's roof. Within his hand he feels his connection grow, with the Force, and with the crystal himself telling him that his decision was correct. Right, I think it might be time to get out of here. Again before he could leave, he felt another pull, but this time much deeper. And it did not feel like a crystal. It was of the Force and seemed to be of the light. Pure and bright was the message sent through the Force. Deciding to be cautious because even a pure light could be much more dangerous than a corrupting dark, he connects with the Force to ask a question. Tell me, what is down there and how is it dangerous? You should go deeper. Blue suddenly speaks up instead of a reply through the Force. Red continues after Blue. What is down there could help fix the problem with your body. Really? It would balance the active and passive dark side energies, further increasing the balance within your body. Red said, It is the opposite of what had happened to you on Dathoma. The ritual you participated in does have a light side equivalent. Blue continued, That would be nice and all. So you are telling me that I won't have to reverse engineer the ritual the Night Sisters did on me? That one is down here. Yes. Both said in unison. How could I trust that? We are you. Are we not? Both again said in unison. Fine. But if something bad happens, I am blaming you. You would be blaming yourself, Blue says in exasperation. Anakin decides to trust their words and starts to head further down into the catacombs. And as the deeper he gets, the more he finds the temperature starts to rise. He was not uncomfortable at all considering his nano suit's functions. But that doesn't mean he is unaware of the change. He comes across a lake. A luminous lake with a lot of crystals shining from underneath deep into the water. This underground lake seems to be boiling and Anakin can tell that he had traveled quite far down for the temperature to rise so much. Who knew that this place could go so deep? Into the water, Blue appeared next to him, while there is a distinct lack of red. Was red, I will be your guide for the following steps. It may take a while so those above may get worried at your absence, but I will try to be as quick as possible. Blue then continued, into the lake. Anakin gets in with little knowledge of what is to happen next. Into meditation, you will need to do so to truly see who you are, what you represent and find the truth about balance within the Force. Entering the lake, Anakin starts to head towards the middle, feeling the light side energies hit, and begin to imbue his body. Thankfully the middle is the only part that is shallow enough to allow him a proper seated posture. Patience is all you need, the force will guide you next. The blue specter leaves him as it dissipates into nothingness. Now all alone with nothing but the force, he starts his meditation. Words echo around him, amalgamating into a conglomeration of dissonant whispers, speaking directly into his mind. Anakin now understands what is happening, his body, mind and soul, is about to experience a transformation not unlike what had happened with the duck side magic ritual. This time it would be to balance the alignment within himself, and to possibly give him his new code, a code for himself. Fortunately he does not pass out, but time passes by with him being none the wiser by its passage, not even his nano suit helping him here. Anakin starts to recite the code younglings use to pass their trials. Emotion, yet peace. Ignorance, yet knowledge. Passion, yet serenity. Chaos, yet harmony. Death, yet the force. Formulating his own, he begins to chant within which stirs something across the galaxy, notifying everyone whom is force sensitive of the event. Flowing through all, there is balance. There is no peace without a passion to create. There is no passion without peace to guide. Knowledge fades without the strength to act. Power blinds without the serenity to see. There is freedom in life. There is purpose in death. The Force is all things and I am the Force. Most of everyone had escaped from the catacombs underneath the Jedi Temple, housing the Crystal Caves of Ilum. They were only waiting for the last of the Initiates to come back, and among those that were not back yet was Anakin. Most of everyone was excited that they had gotten their crystals, and they shared this excitement with each other, their pairs, friends and what they might consider their family, considering they would have grown up together. Yet to return few have. Yoda was speaking towards the other two Jedi Masters present, Mace Windu and Shakti. Worry not Master Yoda. I am sure the kids can handle themselves. Shark T spoke up in this moment, knowing the Padawan she had chosen was also not back yet. Worry not I do. Safe they should be. Yoda responds. Master Windu, why do you think your apprentice is taking so long? T questioned Mace. Mace responded. I don't know, but from how I understand Anakin, he should be just taking his time. Confused and intrigued, T questioned. Taking his time. Does he not fear the closure of the entrance? He would have figured that out almost immediately if not immediately. Mace responds. How would you know? T questions further. I am his master, am I not? Well, he has shown to be more than what his actual age suggests from his physical to mental state of mind. T states her observations. I did not think he would see through the white lie I told. He is much more talented in stuff like that, sensing emotions, thoughts, stuff like that plus his other talents. Mace then continued, but he would not even need to see through that to know that he is safe. It is because he is smart enough to figure it out. I didn't give no clues. 
That doesn't matter, he probably asked someone else about the trials here to know about it. He likes to be prepared after all. Isn't that cheating? Master Yoda, isn't it? T says in exasperation, then directs to Yoda. Padawan Skywalker's methods unorthodox they may be, cheating it is not. Yoda says in slight amusement at Shark T's disbelief. Great, so I could have just asked someone what was to happen when I was going through my trials. Test of emotion Skywalker need not. Proven to Master Windu and others capable of control he is. Yoda continued. Master Yoda is correct in saying he has impeccable control over his emotions. I would not have taught him form via otherwise. Right, that makes sense. Dawn turned to dusk, and it was nearing the time everyone should have been finished. The deadline that was set and most had returned. They continued to wait, and as the day passed the remaining initiates had completed the test, and everyone had finally exited the catacombs. All except one, Anakin. Growing a bit worried, T starts to question if they should go in or not. I think Skywalker may have gotten himself into some trouble. He does that often, but it is unusual that it would take this long. Mace said, Since I do Skywalker is safe. Yoda says, Something was rumbling within the Force, a signal that everyone who is Force sensitive on the planet could feel. The Initiates and the Masters could tell that something was happening within the catacombs. A ripple that spreads from within with no stop. Like a pond, a stone was thrown into the pond and ripples were created. But instead of it dying down, the ripples became stronger and stronger. Master Yoda, you sense that don't you? May spoke to Yoda. Humming, Yoda then says. Sense I do but no not it is. Maybe it has something to do with Skywalker. T says in a questioning tone. An echo goes through the falls, and a voice is heard only to those on the planet of Ilum. Within their minds was it transmitted. Flowing through all, there is balance. There is no peace without a passion to create. There is no passion without peace to guide. Knowledge fades without the strength to act. Power blinds without the serenity to see. There is freedom in life. There is purpose in death. The Force is all things and I am the Force. They all hear the same thing, and most are confused at the chant transmitted to them all. Shark T's facial expression showing confusion. The Initiate's feeling and showing awe. But curiosity and Mace was clearly surprised, as he could swear this mental voice sounded somewhat like Anakin. Master Yoda was the most stoic of the bunch, not showing any expression, and was most immersed within the experience. This experience continues throughout the rest of the night until the dawn of the next day. The Initiates were sent back to the ship, and were told to try and ignore the strange happenings, so they could begin their next step. While the Masters stayed behind waiting for Anakin ready to question him or interrogate him as to what had happened, most did not sleep through the night and only meditated while the kids did and were able to do so even with the pulse from underneath, as if it was coming from the caves itself. Coming out of a meditative state, Yoda senses that end was drawing near. Ending this event is, T having kept her mental state calm, heard Yoda and responded, Is it finally over? Mace stays silent and only awaits for what would happen next. Master T head back you should, little sleep you have had. Yoda told her, Understood, I could use some rest. She was tired as despite being here. Her concentration had broken many times during meditation. She starts to head back while Yoda and Mace continue to wait for Anakin. Master Yoda, what do you think that was? See we will. Back deep within the caves, the amalgamation of voices that was echoing within his mind, and maybe even resonating with the cave he was in, Anakin was within a trance-like state. Unlike that ritual down on Dathoma, this one he could feel had increased his light side alignment affinity helping to balance out the improper energies within himself. If the dark side magic ritual increased his greed and lust, then this time the light had helped further pronounce some of his virtuous character traits, specifically the virtues of kindness and temperance. Greed is the intense and selfish desire for something, especially wealth, power, or food, and Anakin was very ambitious, very greedy for a lot of things. He had done things in accordance to those types of values. Lust is strong sexual desire or a passionate desire for something. In his previous life he was extremely lustful one could say going by his playboy nature. But that did not mean he had no self-control or restraint. Temperance or in other words self-control, justice, honor, and abstention. Again Anakin has shown these traits and has practiced them outwardly towards others and himself. Kindness the quality of being friendly, generous, and considerate. What comes under kindness would be compassion, satisfaction, loyalty, and integrity which are things Anakin had shown to have. He had a theory that he was the sum of two parts, the original Anakin plus him from his previous life. Two characteristics or key features that could sum up his past life's behavior was exactly that, lustful and temperate, but he would not have called himself greedy or all that kind. Here it would seem he developed some traits from the original, or at least what was at his call. The possessive, that was reinforced throughout his life but was there from the beginning. But the kindness, the loyalty and compassion that Anakin showed was there throughout. So, he has come to the conclusion he inherited both of these factors. Lustful and greedy but temperate and kind. It was only brought out by these irrespective rituals he had gone through. For the dark it was these sinful traits, and for the light it was the virtues, all amalgamating into one. Himself. Coming out of the meditative trance he was disoriented. Groaning a little his mental thought processes were jumbled, and the acceleration, the speed of them was not helping matters. My head hurts. His Jedi robes were a bit wet, 
But that didn't matter to much. As he got up from the center of the lake, he was surprised to find that before him, the lake was no more. What was left in his wake was a deep chasm. The lake that had been illuminated, the crystals that were shining from beneath the deep waters, were dim, almost as if they had been absorbed of their residual energies. Even stranger was the discovery that there was a red crystal there in front of him still glowing and pulsing within the force. It was calling out to him, and he picked it up putting it within his pocket, wanting to keep it hidden for when he comes out. Whistling Anakin looks down as his mind starts to clear up. Thankfully I had learned how to fly using the force, otherwise the gap would have been too large for me to cross. Even with the force aiding my body, patting himself, he took a quick look into if his own chosen crystal was sapped of the force. Looking it over, it still glowed up, and he still felt a connection to it, only that it was dormant, ready to be unleashed. Next he decides to use the nano suit to check his body, as it was able to do so with near precise accuracy. Show me the changes. What was visualized was a high-tech 3D representation of his current form. The interface showed everything from his new extra heart to the other internal organs, and even able to monitor the life signs and vitals of his being. Knowing that nothing really physical would have happened, he takes a guess that it may have somehow affected the only thing really connected to the Force. His midi-chlorians. Analyzing. 0%, 40%, 89%, 100% complete. Midi-chlorian count per cell readings. 49,200. Thinking to himself, it increased by another third did it. I have over twice as much I was born with, this increases the potential within myself and the raw power I could use as an output. Using the connected network he records down the results, so he could look into it further down the line, because for now he has to get back to the top. Anakin floats over the massive chasm and lands on the other side, looking back down one more time to see if he could spot some of the lake that was previously there. But there was nothing, just a black void that seemed to continue to go down forever. Best be heading off then. Anakin starts his long trek back to the entrance of the Jedi Temple through the catacombs, and along the way two of his new and temporary friends appear before him again. Finally, you have done it. It took you long enough. I would have completed this process W-A-Y tilde faster. Red says appearing on Anakin's left. Not true, you are too deep within the dark side to ever be able to complete that. Blue says from Anakin's right? Says who? The dark is power and power is strength and through this I would achieve victory. Conquering the light with my unlimited power. The two continue to argue. But Anakin lets them because his temperance has been pronounced. These types of things, even though they annoy him, he has self-control enough to let it pass. Don't mistake that for patience because Anakin believed that there are more important things to do. So if he starts to think it's too much he would shut them down. How long are you two here for? Until I leave or am near leaving the caves. Anakin asks the pair. We will be gone once you leave the planet. But if you are asking if we will still be around then yes it would be until you leave the caves. We will only exist until you leave. Blue says. We are not only an extension of yourself and the Force, we are an extension of this very planet. Red continued. Really? I knew some planets were alive and even had consciousness. But here. Yes, that is correct. But we are not actually the planet, just the connection between you and it. Blue started. Once you are gone, the residual conflicting energies that you had will also go along with it, so if you were ever to return the both of us would not exist. Red continued. Quite sad. Don't be, we are not the living. We are only you, a part of you but still you. Blue says. We don't even necessarily should exist, and would only be a figment of one's imagination. Red then said. You are basically high right now, but because of this and the connection to the force you see us. Red and Blue start to laugh at Anakin, as his expression changed from neutral to disappointment. I should have known. He thinks to himself, be quiet now, or don't involve me in your conversations. I would like a peaceful trip back up to the surface. Don't forget your crystals, Blue says. Anakin checking his pockets again because of paranoia, finds that it is safe and looks towards the pair, seeing them hide chuckles and giggling like a pair of schoolgirls. How frustrating. Anakin's face turns a bit ugly as he continues on his trek back up. Young Skywalker, no emotions remember. That is the Jedi way. Blue says in a mock patronizing tone. Yes, give in to your hate, your passion makes you strong. Red joins in on the teasing. Anakin ignores them both. Ilum. It was finally dawn, and the initiates that had come to Ilum were finally going to start constructing their lightsabers within the ship, along with the droid that is meant to help them. Shark T had also retired to the ship, while Yoda and Mace waited outside the Jedi Temple covering the caves of Ilum. Since young Skywalker I do, Yoda says as the entrance to the caves was still coated in ice. Anakin now could see the reflection of the ice at the entrance, he could also sense that both Yoda and Mace were outside. Looking back behind him, he does not see his two companions he has had on his journey down and up. Gone like the wind. Moving towards the ice-covered entranceway, Anakin lifts his hand upwards, and in a swift motion pulls through the force, shattering the ice like glass. Smiling, Anakin walks out from the entrance to see the blank faces of Yoda and Mace staring back at him. He waves to them as he stumbles forward. Hello there, nodding Mace responds. Great, you have finally come back. You have caused some trouble for the rest of us that had to wait for you here. In fact Master T had to go back to the ship, because she had trouble meditating Mace states. 
Yes, something strange did happen down there. But I did get my crystal so I could make my lightsaber now. Anakin tells the Jedi Masters in front of him. Strange how? Yoda questions. The usual stuff when it comes to the Force, visions and all. Anakin responds. Care to share? Mace raises his eyebrows in the telltale sign that he wants a proper response from Anakin. Truly, I wish to keep it to myself, given that it doesn't really matter too much. But going by both of your reactions, I can only assume that I somehow had created a ruckus. Yes, both Yoda and Mace say at the same time. Sighing, Anakin then goes on to tell a recounted but edited version of events that don't include a lot of things, but only revealed to them that he had a revelation that helped him to gain some form of enlightenment in regards to the Force. Technically what I said was true, but that doesn't mean it was the whole truth, okay? I think we should head back now. Everyone else is waiting to go back to Coruscant. The Initiates want to be chosen as an apprentice, and you are holding them up. Mace said, Yes, yes, I understand. Anakin responded. The now group of three continued down to the ship's parked location, while some idle chat started up between the three. Say, young Padawan, have you grown taller since you went into that cave? Mace questioned Anakin. Have I? I didn't notice. Yes, it would seem you are now nearing my height. Mace was actually 1.93 meters tall. Anakin had grown to an impressive 1.9 meters of height without knowing it. Not that he bothered to check. But if he had an assumption he would link it back to the event that happened within the catacombs. Something similar had happened with Dark Side Magic Ritual. So why wouldn't something similar happen again? That was just the opposing energies of the Force. I did spend an entire day and night within. So it must have happened during that time. Anakin fakes ignorance. In fact it was more than just the rituals reinforcing and increasing his size. But the implants he had put into himself this very year. Those implants were meant to rapidly expand his hormonal growth patterns. To change the structure of his skeletal and muscular systems. It is no surprise that he would be inching closer and closer to the projected heights. And it is not like he would be the tallest being ever considering there were other species that would reach a massive height in comparison. A comparison would be the Twi'lek where they could have average heights ranging from 1.6 to 2.4 meters. Compared to his projected maximum of 2.3 meters, that is still smaller than the average height range of the Twi'lek. Strange height is. Yoda sighs as he is practically towered over by the two humans walking next to him. But don't mistake his form for weakness, because he is anything but. Noticing that the ship was off into the distance the group started to increase their speeds through the force, dashing across the ice planet's surface to their carrier. Deciding to be mischievous Anakin tells the other two through telepathy. I will race you there. He speeds past the other two going towards the ship. Not to take the challenge lying down, Mace decides to indulge this race. While Yoda thinks of this as not conductive. Master Windu's young apprentice an effect on him it would seem. It was true, Anakin had been slowly loosening up the tight ass to become more free in his joy for life. He did not take away from Mace's seriousness or the calm dangerous nature he had hidden within, but had passively encouraged some growth within the master. Dashing across the ice, Anakin managed to make it back faster than Mace, but he was just right behind him. Got to take it easy on the old man, he is getting along in the years. Anakin thought to himself, Mace wasn't out of breath or anything like that, but he was definitely not becoming younger. At least he benefits somewhat from the exercise, considering he is a part of the council. Anakin knows the council don't just sit on their bums all day long, but they certainly do it a lot. It would seem the apprentice has overcome the master. Anakin directs towards Mace. Haha, <laughs> very funny. I know that you went easy on me. Don't think I haven't been keeping an eye on you every now and then. Soon after Yoda arrived, it would seem that Master Yoda's age is catching up to him. Anakin says in jest. Yoda responds. Old I may be but underestimate me you should not. He said sagely. The three headed inside to get everything ready, while Anakin traveled towards another room. Knowing this would be where he discovers what type of saber he would create. The lightsaber, also referred to as a laser sword or space sword by those who are unfamiliar with it, was a distinctive weapon, the very image of which was inextricably bound with the mythos of the Jedi Order and their polar opposites, the Sith. The lightsaber also became synonymous with the Jedi Order's values to uphold peace and justice throughout the galaxy. This perception endured, despite the many conflicts with lightsaber-wielding Sith and Dark Jedi. The weapon consisted of a blade of pure plasma emitted from the hilt and suspended in a force containment field. The field contained the immense heat of the plasma, protecting the wielder, and and allowed the blade to keep its shape. The hilt was almost always self-fabricated by the wielder to match his or her specific needs, preferences and style. The hilt was also built similarly to his or her master's lightsaber as a mark of respect. Due to the weightlessness of plasma and the strong gyroscopic effect generated by it, lightsabers required a great deal of strength and dexterity to wield. 
and it was extremely difficult and dangerous for the untrained to attempt using. However, in the hands of an expert of the force, the lightsaber was a weapon to be greatly respected and feared. To wield a lightsaber was to demonstrate incredible skill and confidence, as well as masterful dexterity and attunement to the force. The lightsaber Anakin wanted to create had to be versatile, powerful and capable of operating in every conditions, including underwater knowing that lightsabers could short out if going under. There are many lightsaber crystals that could be used. But Anakin had chosen to wait for this day to come, knowing that there would be more than enough opportunities in the future to upgrade or gain another lightsaber. From the battles of Rashford to the peacekeeping of Paliak, the lightsaber is a Jedi's only true ally. But how do they work? Hum, yes, you have brought me crystals, but they're all useless unless you give them life. The droid, named Hying said to Anakin, Do you know how to awaken the force within the crystal? No. Then I suggest you listen and learn, until you think of a question this droid cannot answer. The droid continued, What if I already know how to do so? Anakin questioned curious to know the answer. Then you wouldn't be here now would you? I guess I wouldn't. Professor Hying was a masculine programmed architect droid, who guided the initiates of the Jedi Order in the construction of their lightsabers, based aboard the Jedi training cruiser Crucible. Considering that you are the last one to arrive, I think that would mean you must be the least talented of the bunch. Hying said, if that is what you believe Anakin says with some exasperation. And, aren't you a little too old to be a Jedi initiate? I am not as old as I look, but you would be right in assuming that I am not a initiate but already a Padawan. A special individual now, aren't you? Hey, you're one to talk, questioning my age when you are quite old yourself. Why? Everyone questions my legitimacy as a proper droid because of my age. You must be just like the rest then. You started it first. I, I guess I did, didn't I? Anakin had seen a lot of broken down bits and pieces before, but to see this thing before him, even though functional it was just about ready to break down. I guess we can start then. Hying brings out everything that is available to a Jedi to create their personalized defensive item. Or should he say weapon? Anakin starts to look at Hying weirdly. My greed is acting up. I want all the knowledge stored within that droid's artificial intelligence. Right, Padawan Anakin Skywalker? That would be your name and current title correct. Hying didn't notice Anakin's weird stare. Yes, it is. Great. Now let's begin the process. You should get into a meditative position to help assist you in connecting with the Force. This should increase the connection between you and the Saber's crystal, further assisting you in its creating. Hying said. Anakin does as the droid says, and begins to use the Force to sense which parts are meant to be which, and what he should do with them. You are a rather quick learner, aren't you? Now, this may take time just as it had with the others, but they are still in the meditation stage, so I don't expect much from you. Hying continued. Anakin opens one eye to stare at the droid. Maybe I should just take it under my control closing his I, Anakin decides to forget about the droid for a bit. Before placing the crystal in the lightsaber, the Jedi or Sith had to imbue it with the Force. To do this, the Force user was required to meditate on the crystal for many days. It had only been about a day since the Initiates had collected their crystals, and would take a process of a few days to finally be able to complete their sabers. Anakin also had to start somewhere but he has a distinct feeling it would not take long at all. At least for him. The crystal that he had gotten was blue in color, meaning he would have a blue-colored saber. He felt that it was the correct choice, and he had also collected a second one, but was of the a very rare color as well, red. A natural red crystal within the caves of Ilum. Delving into the Force, Anakin connected with the Force and the crystal, looking deep within himself, and imbuing his Force energy into the crystal slowly but surely making sure it was ready. Within the next few hours he had completed it, and hiring the droid was nowhere to be seen. I guess he just left me here now to start with the hilt. Anakin using the force started to construct the hilt of his saber. Considering his fighting style and taking it into account, he could come to a few variables when it came to shape. Of course to start off would be the standard hilt, given that Mace uses this hilt. It would seem that it would fit in perfectly with Form Vai. Then there was curved hilt that would suit a singular saber duelist. That wouldn't really suit Anakin's style in particular, but was unique enough that it might fit. The last was the double-bladed hilt that allowed for variability, which would increase the amount of forms he could switch between. Thankfully, Anakin does not only have one crystal, but a secondary one as well. I think I will go with the double-bladed hilt. Anakin constructs this in accordance with his design. Now onto the blade variations. First, I will need to include bifurcating cyclical ignition pulse, which will essentially allow me to use the saber underneath water if the time ever comes for me to do so. Anakin added on the bifurcating cyclical ignition pulse casing, since I have practically two lightsabers, but in one I could adjust which saber has which blade variation. The blue saber would have the dual phase, which would allow for rapid transitions between two sets of preset lengths. The first preset would be the standard length, while the second preset will be shorter for precision cutting. The red side of the saber would have a similar dual phase calibration, but instead of getting smaller, this one would do the opposite. The first preset will be standard, while the secondary will be an increased length to increase chances of surprising an opponent. That should be it. Having finally calibrated everything to the way he wants, at least for now because it is not perfect, 
and not up to the standards that he would like. Again my greed is acting up. I have to sacrifice a few things first, and then experiment later on. For now, this will have to do. Anakin thought to himself before being interrupted as Hying entered the room. Right, I am back. Have you given up ye dash hying stops before he could finish seeing the completed lightsaber within Anakin's hands? Not ignited of course. Well I guess I am not needed here. The droid then turns around and walks right back outside of the room Anakin was meditating in. While Anakin had these two sabers, that doesn't mean that they were the only two. Within this universe, it is quite common for someone to have lost their saber or have it destroyed which is again common. Because of this people have new lightsabers made quite frequently. Anakin wanted to do so much more, but the basic design is something he is content with for now. Ilum. Within the Jedi training cruiser, the Crucible, the Initiates were still in the process of creating their lightsabers, but have not left the planet of Ilum yet, but would be doing so soon, because it had been a few days since their stay. Master Yoda and Master Windu had already gone back to Coruscant seemingly on important business, while Anakin had been left behind, along with Shakti, here to guide the rest after they had finished constructing their lightsabers. Yoda and Mace had been picked up from another transport ship. To think the last to come out of the caves would be the first to complete their saber. T had become quite attached to Anakin, and if he had to guess why, it was because she was a rather lonely person. Yes, who would have thought that the supposed chosen one would be capable enough? Anakin replied in a self-deprecating tone. Right, some people are convinced that you are to uphold this supposed prophecy. Among them there has even been a wave, an increase of people who believe so. T continued, raising an eyebrow, Anakin questions. Some people have started to believe in that prophecy. No, you said there were more people that are believing in it. Yes, among the masters. There were at first many people who doubted that what Qui-Gon had said was correct, but now much more of us believe in it. Do you? I am not one to place all responsibilities on a child, but I can see the progress you have made, and can say that it is certainly extraordinary. So you believe it then? No, I simply believe that you are much more than what the prophecy gives credit for. T keeps a straight face while giving this clear answer. Anakin stays silent not having anything to say. The students are nearly done here. We will be heading back to Coruscant today if they are fast enough. And even if they aren't, we will still head back. How kind of you. Very. T left for another area, presumably the room she was temporarily staying in. Coruscant. After the Initiates were done constructing their lightsaber on Ilum, Shakti, Anakin and the Initiates had gone back to Coruscant. We are finally back, Anakin says as he exits the spacecraft. T was directing the Initiates. Alright, now that everyone has made their lightsaber we will be going back to the temple for your next trials to commence. Everyone gets onto some speeders to get back to the temple, right? Go on. Everyone back to their daily routines. Anakin said out loud to the Initiates and they listened going about their business. Anakin had taken on a role within the trials. But he wasn't a guide just there because he was there for himself. But that did not mean he couldn't help out the others. He had been so kind to even help out the future apprentice of Deepa Balaba in the construction of her saber. I should be going now. I was informed of some important matters that I should attend to. T directed to Anakin as they were alone now. May the force be with you. Anakin used the usual words when force sensitives part ways. And may the force be with you. But I don't think it would ever really be a part now, would it? Considering on record it was said you were conceived of midi-chlorians. Very funny. Anakin deadpanned but continued with some jest. But that would mean the Force is sort of like a parent to me. Isn't it to everyone? T finishes and then starts to leave. Bye. See you later. Anakin responded. Running down the hallways of the Jedi Temple was an older young adult Twi'lek going at a very rapid pace. Arnie. The Jedi Padawan Isla calls out to Anakin, using the nickname assigned to him from numerous people. Confused, Anakin starts thinking mentally. How the hell did she know I had come back? Coming to a halt the Isla was just about ready to pounce on top of Anakin, but restrained and controlled herself remembering the Jedi Code, and that it would be embarrassing to do so even if she were not a Jedi. Welcome back, she says hiding her shyness. Thanks. Anakin smiles at her, which if one paid close attention enough, they would find her response to be to blush if only a bit. Well, Isla says in a questioning tone. What? Anakin decides to play up some ignorance of what she wants. Glaring a bit, she looks him up and down. Wait, did you grow taller? I could have swore that you were around 10 centimeters shorter. Maybe. Knowing she wouldn't get a proper answer, she decides to move back to her original topic. Show me your lightsaber. Whoa, calm down. We may be friends here, but I don't think that we should be moving so fast. Take me on a date first. Anakin replies in jest. Not one to be bothered by the joke intently stares at him. Anakin sighs and reluctantly takes out his dual-bladed lightsaber. Here you go then. I do not think it is anything special, but have a look. Now holding the saber, Isla looks the design over. This is very Arnie. Well, it is certainly big. Not one to take a challenge lying down. Isla says this towards Anakin only because there is no one else around. Raising an eyebrow Anakin says to Isla. Wait until you ignite the blade. Doing so, Isla takes care in activating the lightsaber. 
And what comes out on one end was the blue colored blade on one end. Blue. Continue. Isla then activates the other side, and it ignites another blue blade. And blue again, Anakin had made sure to include a switch that hide the red blade just in case. Don't want the Jedi to freak out now. He had done this little trick by interring with the process, and using the force to control the flow of energy. He could minimize either color and overwrite a good portion of the crystals with each other, meaning that while they will retain their original colors, it could be controlled to seem as if he had either two red blades or two blue blades. Yes, but there is always more to it. Before Isla could admire his handiwork anymore, he used telekinesis to take it out of her hands and deactivated the blades. It can be detached from each other as well, so as to make sure I don't have to constantly use the dual blade feature. Why is yours so much better than mine? I actually put effort in. Or I could just be more talented who know. Anakin continues to joke with her. Maybe you just don't know how to work a blade. Insert Lenny face here. One of Anakin's thought processes stops what it was doing just to mentally think this. Isla faltered here and pouted a bit before asking Anakin a question. I guess this means you have officially become a Padawan. Always has been. I know that. What I mean is that you could finally be taken on missions by one of your masters. Isla sighed in annoyance. There is that too. That would also mean that I would be unable to I mean we, myself, Barris and even Ahsoka would not be able to see you as often. Isla catches herself before fully exposing herself. But at this point Anakin would be blind to not see what is going on. You make it sound like I will never be around. Anakin continues to have slight smile that may be mistaken for a smirk. Whatever, Isla throws this subject to the back of her mind before continuing. Let's head over to the practice rooms. I want to test out your new lightsaber. Sure, testing my saber are we? Anakin again says in a joking tone. Isla doesn't respond and starts to walk towards the direction of the training rooms that Anakin and Isla had been using. It also conveniently is quite a handy storage place for Anakin's droids as well. Not that he would need it now considering his underground base beneath the Jedi Temple. Within the Jedi High Council's meeting room. A mission we have. Your apprentice Padawan Skywalker go with you he must. Yoda spoke towards Qui-Gon who was standing in the middle of the room. Not all of the masters were present. But Yoda, Mace, Yaddle and Kai Adi Mundi were there as of now. May I know what this mission is about? Qui-Gon questions. A diplomatic one. Mace speaks here. Qui-Gon sighs mentally. Not a diplomatic mission. Mentally complaining he then continues. And where may tell does this take place? What exactly is going on that it would need both me and Anakin to go to? The Republic has grown interested in the events happening on the planet of Tatrine. They have refused becoming a part of the Republic for unknown reasons, after the change in leadership. Mace explains. Skywalker Industries is also another big part of this decision that the Republic go there and help out. So it was made that we the Jedi were to intervene as well. Mace continues. A situation has occurred that could lead to a war between the new leadership of Tatooine and the Hutts. From what we know and most others know, that is public knowledge is that the our young Padawan has apparently been ascended to the position of a prince there. For obvious reasons we want you and him to go there and mediate. This is a very fragile situation, considering that the Republic wants to get involved themselves. Mace then mutters under his breath. Stupid wealth hoarders. The Republic sees great benefit in continuing a healthy relationship with Tatrine, and wishes to continue to do so. Mace pauses to take a breath. Go with Anakin to his homeworld to sort out the situation. Is it wise to send us there with Padawan Skywalker? He is inexperienced when it comes to any mission, taking on such a huge responsibility on his first would surely be detrimental. Kai Adi Mundi intervenes here. We believe that the situation here puts Anakin in the best position to do so, considering his mother is the current queen. Dangerous it is but trust in the apprentice we must. Yoda says. Deepa Balaba remains silent as she has nothing of importance to add except. I believe that it would be fine to allow Skywalker on a trip back to his homeworld. Believe you do he is ready. Yoda questions. Yes. T answers. Go now, take your apprentice then. But I would advise you to be cautious. There is something about the situation and the sequence of events that do not put me at ease. Kai Adi Mundi cautions. Kwai bows before them and leaves the room. Care to explain your unease, Master Mundi? T questions after Kwai Gon left. Something within the Force is telling me that what is happening on Tatrine was the result of an orchestrated plan. Obviously, T answers back with some sass. I am not referring to the rebellion by the slaves. I am referring to the Republic getting involved when they shouldn't. It is outside of our territories. Something else that appeared strange to me was the rejection from the leadership of Tatooine. Why would they not become under the Republic? The situation they are facing now could have been much more easily resolved by simply getting protection from the Republic. No, not the reasons. Yoda responds. Humming, Mace then speaks. It is definitely strange, but everything should be answered once Jedi Master Qui-Gon and Padawan Skywalker complete their task. Interested have Palpatine grown with the emergence of an empire within the Outer Rims. 
that was started by the rebellion of slaves. In fact, he had grown interested even more so because the current leadership there was not as simple as it seemed. A monarchy along with a democracy. How quaint. It would seem that one of his subjects of academic interest, the young Anakin Skywalker was also somewhat involved. How much so he did not know. What he did know though was that Skywalker Industries started up by the young Jedi's mother, had become rich and integral to many people within higher office. In fact, the very same creator of the company was now the queen of her own homeworld. A slave elevated to a position of unsubstantial power. It should be me. Palpatine had tried oh so hard to make sure Tatooine and its leadership capitulated to the Republic. This would help him immensely, but it would seem the current elected leaders were against this. Even the queen herself refused the Republic's proposal. The slave is smarter than what would be suggested. He had concocted a plan to make them subservient to him, and the success all depends on the hearts who were pressuring them from one side. While he sends the Jedi to mediate, he had specifically set things up to make sure the young Skywalker returned to his homeworld to convince his mother to join the Republic. How could the boy refuse? He has basically become a part of the Republic, and has been captivated to its beauty. No matter his appearance he is after all but a child. Sidious thinks everything will go his way. What he doesn't know is that Anakin is far from a simple child. It doesn't matter either way of what happens, Palpatine would either succeed in bringing Tatooine under his future empire or he would destroy the beginnings of something that could get in his way. He had felt that it would, the Force had reinforced this fact. He couldn't let things hinder his plans. At the entrance to Anakin's room, he opens the door to see Qui-Gon waiting just outside the door. It has been decided, we have a mission to get to. Qui-Gon says to Anakin, a mission, where to? Anakin questions back thinking that it may be similar to the originals. Tatooine, your homeworld. Qui-Gon answers, the reason. Anakin questions further already knowing about the Ontatwine through his constant monitoring, and the reports he gets from the droids there. It would seem that a war is brewing back on your homeworld, and your position to the people there would help immensely in allowing us an audience there. Qui-Gon then continues, we will go there to settle the brewing conflict between the Huts and the leadership of Tatooine. Hopefully it doesn't go like my last mission. I hope so too. Anakin replied. Pack your things then, we need to leave immediately. Qui-Gon states. I don't need to bring anything extra. Qui-Gon says in slight surprise at the start then continues. Really? Alright then, let's get going. Right behind you. Anakin follows behind Qui-Gon. A lot of things had happened on Tatooine, and most if not everything that had occurred, were a result of Anakin's planning. The Hutts wanting to go to war to get their system back, his doing of course, but it would have happened either way with him funding and leading the rebellion. What Anakin had to be mindful of though was Palpatine trying to have a hand in play, even though he should be focused on other things it would seem his interest in anything to do about himself had increased substantially. While Anakin and Qui-Gon were using the Force to move across the hallways of the Jedi Temple, someone saw them going at those fast speeds. Barris was walking herself to her next lesson when she saw the two of them dashing to go somewhere. Anna dashed before she could let her words finished he had moved past her. Pouting Barris doesn't put too much thought into being ignored and continues thinking it must be something important. The scimitar. This vessel was originally designed as a hunter-killer, with many unique capabilities. It is a very special ship. It has had very special owners. Anakin said to Qui-Gon as they boarded. Anakin had decided it would be best to use this ship, and he didn't mind exposing his ownership over it considering he had used Mechaderi to completely take over everything within. Quite the vessel, Qui-Gon stated. The scimitar, also known as the Sith Infiltrator, was a heavily modified star carrier, and the personal starship of Darth Maul. On Tatooine, Anakin had decided that it does not belong to Maul anymore, and would be his compensation for him saving his life. Of course, he had taken the ship before he saved Maul's life, but he still did it in the end. Set coordinates for Tatooine. Anakin's command made the ship come alive. The Sith Infiltrator featured folding wings around its spherical cockpit, and was secretly modified from a star courier manufactured by Republic Sienna Systems. The craft featured six laser cannons, a proton torpedo launcher and a minilayer. Along with its deadly armament, the scimitar was equipped with a cloaking device, powered by rare stygium crystals from the planet Eden 2, that allowed it to disappear from view, and any pursuing ship's sensors. Owing to the craft's experimental iron engines, radiator fins on the ship's wings were required to be opened during flight in order to expel excess heat. The ship carried three DRK-1 Dark Eye probe droids and the Bloodfin, a Sith speeder utilized by Darth Maul during his mission on Tatooine, but transformed to Anakin's liking. The scimitar was capable of tracking a ship's signature through hyperspace, something considered impossible for other ships. Quite an advanced piece of technology. Anakin then spoke aloud. This ship should have an easier time helping us on future missions. Nothing stopped a Jedi from owning a ship. It certainly didn't stop Anakin, and did not stop others as well. It was just that Anakin's craft was very special. I can see that. The ship automatically lifts itself into the atmosphere of Coruscant and leaves, so it could enter a hyperspace lane. 
Anakin had let Sienna help Palpatine create specialized ships, as he knew it would only help himself, so he had only taken back his rightful property. If Palpatine ever saw the ship in his hands, he would be unable to even know that it was his. The design and capabilities were nearly all the same, but he had changed things enough to make it seem like it was brand new. Given that he had reinvented everything on the ship however, it would be impossible for Palpatine to find out either way. Entering hyperspace. Don't worry master I have upgraded this ship so it was capable of automatic flight. It would not need the aid of a pilot. What a brilliant contraption. It was no wonder Skywalker Industries was so successful. Qui-Gon replied in wonder. Well, I am in control of the ship, and it is not really automatic. But it is better to tell a lie here, given the nature of my control is considered a part of the duck side. Entering a hyperspace lane that would get them in the direction of Tatrine, the two set off. Say, my young apprentice when would you have had the time to create something like this? If you were thinking I did this while I was supposed to be locked up within the temple, I will have you know I had done making this before that happened. Really now? Qui-Gon stared at Anakin expecting him to falter. But Anakin does not because he has been training for far too long, and has had much experience when it comes to hiding or masking his face with no expression. Yes. Alright then. How long until we get there? Previously I would have said it would not take too long. But now it won't take long times 10. Meaning, we will get there extremely fast, much faster than any transport ship we Jedi normally would use. That is good then, time is of the essence. It really is something when the Jedi, not one had asked Anakin whether he would be okay with going back to Tatrine, especially when his mother was there. It was obvious they would fear this decision, but only kept that fear to themselves, and did not voice this out loud. Anakin doesn't mind this too much, given that this is how they are. What he does mind however, is that they were quite unfeeling, too much like droids. How the hell were you supposed to have compassion if you weren't allowed to feel at all? Anakin was having some mental processes create an argument that would lead nowhere, because it was only within his head. Above Tatrine, we have arrived. Anakin walked towards the room Qui-Gon was in and directed towards him. Some time had passed by, and the two just started to meditate, given that there wasn't much else to do. Qui-Gon got up to take a look outside the cockpit, to see exactly how much much Tatooine had changed from what he had remembered. Around the planet there were some ships, vessels both large and small, that housed some of the droids Anakin had manufactured and had taken control of. There was even the Trade Federation's droid control ship, but it had obviously been remodeled, repaired and upgraded to better assist Anakin, the droids and the inhabitants on board. Quite the view. Tatooine itself still looked quite dry, at least from above, but weirdly enough if one looked closely enough at certain points throughout the planet, the landscape was very slowly starting to change. Where once there were sandy dunes, there were now small splotches of green. The cities itself had been constructed really fast, but that doesn't mean that they did not get the necessary upgrades that they needed. Well take us to the main flagship here. I doubt that they would let us into the capital without being checked first. Qui-Gon said, Okay, you got it. Anakin turning towards the communications device on board, started to ping the supposed flagship, calling Tatooine's flagship. Someone shows up on the monitor while also transmitting both Anakin and Qui-Gon to the person on the other side. It was grievous. He had been prepared because he knew that Anakin would be arriving here with another, one of his current Jedi Masters, the Negotiators. Grievous's voice comes through. That would be us. Hello, my name is Qui-Gon Jinn, and I am a Jedi sent here from the Republic along with my young apprentice, Anakin Skywalker, but I am sure you know of him already. Qui-Gon replies, Yes, I am aware of the not-so-little prince. Grievous immediately notices Anakin had grown again, since they had last seen each other. That is great, we would like to request an audience with the Queen. Qui-Gon continues as Anakin stays silent because everything was meant to be cared for by Qui-Gon as the master but also the primary of the mission. Of course, anything for the prince. Grievous replies. Anakin does not do anything to correct the terms of address. Qui-Gon and Anakin are given leeway to land on Tatooine, and their destination is the remodeled capital of the Sandy Wastes. Mos Esper. Going towards the capital Anakin and Qui-Gon do not need to land on any outskirts, but there is a specific area to land at, and they are meet there by the current sit-in general, Grievous. This way, please. It had not taken too long to demolish the old, and then rebuild with the new, and the city itself had been transformed from a shady port to the beginnings of a beautiful utopian civilization. Given that the atmosphere had low reserves of breathable air, and that the species here were only subsisting on that, the first thing to do was to stabilize the living conditions of those who were living there. Second would be the creation of jobs, and many new local establishments had been made. People seemed to be happy at least. Anakin thought to himself, he had after all put a lot of his time, effort and energy into creating a safe and livable environment here on Tatooine. Obviously it was not perfect, but the attention to detail because of his massive brainpower, processes and all was he able to succeed where others would fail. 
Anakin had taken trees not native to the planet and implanted it within the cities, and had created artificial biospheres, meant to maintain and provide a stable environment for the people here. Of course everything was semi-artificial, meaning that some technology was used to create this. And of course he had used Mekudero on said technology to make improvements and work around the floors, by either finding a way to make up for them, or outright fixing them. Quite the accomplishment don't you think, Arnie? Qui-Gon asked him as they walked the newly restructured streets of Mos Espa. Yes, it could be much better though. Anakin said the first part out loud, but said the second being quietly to himself. Anakin was never satisfied with his work, but that is what happens. Everyone is unsatisfied with the end product even when others praise it for the beauty or grandness they show. Mos Espa wasn't the only place that had been restructured. There had also been a massive development within the other communities spread throughout Tatooine. Grievous interjected here. Really? Do tell. Qui-Gon was curious. We have decided to start terraforming this planet back into the beautiful scenery told from ancient history and legends. Grievous stated. That is interesting. Do tell me of how you are capable of this. It was all thanks to the prince and the queen for their technology they created to better the society here. It would seem that your creative abilities are quite the marvel, Anakin. Qui-Gon spoke. It would seem so. Of course. There are the workers, the employees and many others that helped in the development process but most of it could be attributed towards these two people. Grievous then continued, There are also the droids here that could do most if not all of the hard laborious work that normal fleshy beings would be hard pressed to do. That would be a problem, Qui-Gon said. Thankfully it is not. Grievous replied as they have now come to their destination completely protected by droids. An entrance to a grand constructed building that used to be the living district for the Skywalker residents also being the residents of freed and runaway slaves. In its place stood a grand structure that had Skywalker etymology written across and drawn into the pillars holding and supporting the palace created. A palace for a king, no an emperor. Anakin thought to himself, it would seem my droids went a little overboard. This is quite something. Grievous having known Anakin long enough smokes internally at his surprise, even though it does not show on his face. Everything within was a great story. A retelling of what had happened, and the subsequent elevation of Anakin Skywalker from slave to prince, and of course, it detailed his mother, other people, but sculpted into the walls basically told a story like a long lost legend. The devotion the droids had towards Anakin was bordering on the extreme if it wasn't already. This palace was built in honor of the queen and the prince. But other dignitaries and those who are elected officials by the people sometimes gather here to discuss important matters. Grievous says before continuing, but the main conference room would be in the main hall where the monarch's throne is. We rejoin Grievous, Anakin and Qui-Gon walking through the entranceway going towards the conference room of the planet's officials and leadership within the palace, main hall throne room. Walking into the throne room, the three are greeted to the side of some people throughout the room and some droids stationed at various points. Grievous speaks here to the people within the room, presenting the Jedi Master Qui-Gon Jinn and the Prince, Anakin Skywalker. The people here were elected representatives of the people, the freed slaves and the common folk. Silence. Before strangely enough, some if not most of them moved towards the two. My Prince. A lot of them were referring to Anakin as the Prince. Qui-Gon seemed a bit uncomfortable with the situation given they had surrounded them rather quickly. My Prince, you have finally returned. There is much to discuss. And we would like to ask of your opinion. Qui-Gon interrupts. I am sorry to interrupt, but I am afraid Anakin here has to give up his position as a prince here, because he has decided to become a Jedi. Nonsense? It does not matter to us out here whether or not he is now a part of somewhere or something else. He came from here, helped us and is the only living child of the Queen. So he would be the next in line to inherit the position. An advisor said. A bit frustrated here Qui-Gon begins. I am afraid that is not how it wore Dash. But he is stopped by Anakin. Thank you, all for welcoming me back, but I am here for only a temporary time frame, and have many more things to do before I could possibly hope to take the throne for myself. Anakin said, of course, of course. Many of the dignitaries reply with exclaims of how humble or how well educated Anakin is. They seem to be taking on their new roles quite quickly. It is as if they have lived their entire lives as important political figures. They also seem to like kissing up to my derriere. Anakin thought to himself, I thank you all. But I am here because of my current duties as a Jedi. Anakin continued. Qui-Gon then continues. Yes, as my young apprentice has said we were sent here as negotiators to help with the situation here on Tatooine between yourselves and the Huts. We do not need the Republic's help. A voice comes from behind the group. Jira. The Grand Moverly figure walks out from behind a doorway. Followed behind her was one of the young freedom fighters that had been on Tatooine. Trella Barrera. There were two others as well, the twin Twi'lek Jella sisters, Anantan. Quite the creative names they have. Jira then continued. Sorry, 
But I think we have already been introduced. She directs towards Qui-Gon first. Yes, you were so kind to provide myself and my companions with some free food. Anything for Arnie? Jira smiles here whilst looking towards Anakin standing beside Qui-Gon and the dignitaries surrounding him. Well, would you look at that? Arnie has finally made it home. Not really caring for the people around her and going as fast as her old bones would take her, Jira moved towards Anakin. Let me see you. She looked him up and down. My have you grown? I know. Anakin has a smile on his face and accepts Jira's embrace not really caring that Qui-Gon was right next to him. Deciding to be the party pooper of the reunion Qui-Gon coughs a bit before speaking up. Yes, well, I think we should best be getting back to business. What I am most curious to know though is where is the queen? She is indisposed at the moment. Trella spoke coming from behind Jira. Anakin doesn't know about anything that would keep Shmai down, knowing all of the protection and countermeasures he had put in place to make sure she would be healthy. He starts to question Trella again ignoring what Qui-Gon may think of his attachment. What is the problem? Ann and Tan spoke near simultaneously. The Queen isn't in any danger, nothing physical or anything she is just tired, and we did not know that you would come so quickly. In fact she would be most pleased to see her child dash. Anakin interrupts them before they could finish. That is fine. I do not need to see her, nor she need to see me just yet. If she needs some sleep then I would suggest she get that. They bow? Very well. Qui-Gon now having a chance to question, asks Jira. So, who is the de facto leader here now? It would have been the next in line to help magistrate everything. But since the prince is not available and would be the mediator of the conflict along with yourself, it would mean the person with the most power after that. Jira explained. Which would be? Qui-Gon asked. That would have been General Lord Vader. But he is also currently indisposed and is off-world at the moment. While Jira says the name Vader most of the people give off a mixture of emotions. Some scared, some respect, but some fear, and some outright devoted to the strength that was displayed by the mysterious figure. Raising an eyebrow, Qui-Gon then asks. Vader is an interesting name, but now it would seem that with this General Vader not here, you would need another person to talk with us. And that is why I am here, Jira explains. I may not be the most high up within the newly established government here, but I am well respected, and the people listen to me. And what would your role be? Qui-Gon continued questioning. It would be an advisory position, next to the Queen. Jira answered. I see Qui-Gon replied with some uncertainty, given that the old lady was nothing more than a simple farmer's market saleswoman. My experience with the people, the various cultures here on Tatooine, is what helped me here, given I was once a part of the common folk myself. Jira said. Jira continued. I have experience with the economy here as well. I was a part of the local businesses, even though it would not be to the same scale the Queen and the Prince were capable of building too. Alright, now let me reintroduce ourselves then given that some new people are present. Qui-Gon paused before continuing. I am Jedi Master Qui-Gon Jinn, and this is my young apprentice Padawan Anakin Skywalker, or what everyone else here would refer to as the Prince. I believe it is time we go over the basics, before the Queen is ready to rejoin the discussion before negotiations begin with the hearts. Qui-Gon finished. Everyone agreed with the plan to debrief Qui-Gon only because Anakin was here and was here as the student of Qui-Gon and not some random person. Into the deep of the night within the night cycle of Tatooine, there were many shadowy figures running across the streets of Mos Espa. Security measures were at an all-time high, but that did not mean there were no flaws to the system created, and it was constantly being upgraded to make sure crime that happened within was monitored. This would be a no one had access to this system other than all the connected droids who would only follow his commands, or those assigned to the system as admins or moderators. Close to the newly constructed palace that housed the benevolent Queen of Tatrine was a very few people who were very well prepared for their mission. Assassins, cloaked in all black to better blend in with their dark environments, because not every part of the city was completed, and many things were still being implemented or changed to better accommodate the residents. Speaking through a device one speaks. Everyone within positions. Replies are spoken through. Yes. Multiple people respond. Infiltration start. The people, the assassins swiftly maneuvered themselves through the palace walls, and are able to climb upwards trying to go to the area they needed to go. Quietly now, the leader of the assassins spoke. We are only here for the queen. Once she is dealt with we would be able to claim the lofty prize the huts have created. That was right, a specialized bounty just for the life of Shmai Skywalker was created. So they could create chaos, and hopefully swoop right in to redeclare that the Tatooine system was once again a part of their territories. Now entering the palace, the assassins had to work their way around the various patrolling droids, and the various spots that cameras were placed to better guard the Queen and Associates. Ugh. A small transmission was sent over the assassin's transmission device, and a cry of pain was heard by everyone else. Report. The leader hissed quietly. Report. He repeated his statement. Damn it, we are not aborting now. We have gotten so far and the leader whispered to everyone within his team. But Captain, you can't possibly think we would be successful Dash. Shut it and just continue. Everyone went back to trying to secure the place. But every so often more and more calls and cries of pain. 
were called out through the transmission device, further increasing the anxiety everyone on this assassination attempt were on. Hello. The captain tried to get a red on his teammates. Report, anyone. The area was deathly silent, and the tension within his body was now helping him as of this moment. Cursing up and down. Silently the captain decides to abort the mission, finally giving up his determinism or arrogance, or pride to turn tail and run. If anyone can hear me on this signal, I am giving the orders that you are to retreat and not continue. Retrace your steps and try to make it out alive. I can't be losing any more of Dash's words are cut short as a figure appears before him. He reactivates his device again to say his last words. This is Tyler Revenue, and this would be the last time anyone will hear me, or even see me. I would just like to say, if anyone at all is still alive and has escaped that please. I beg of you look after my farmy dash again cut shirt. A sound is heard on the other side, as the device doesn't turn off immediately, and a distorted voice is heard that is not Tyler's. Tyler Revenue, assassin sent here by the huts. A menacing modulated voice is heard through the other side, and it was distorted. But it was off to the distance. Please, spare me. I will do anything. I have a family. What seemed to be Tyler's voice cried out loud. Some distinct breathing is heard clearly as silence had befallen, and only the sounds of the breathing and the sounds of some choking was heard. One should be careful not to choke on their aspirations. Again the modulated voice spoke. And unfortunately no one else was left alive to hear your cry for mercy. Your last words. It is only I, and you are now at my mercy. If others were here that had meet the voice, they would recognize it as Vader. Now die for you heresy. More choking sounds are heard from the device before it is suddenly destroyed. Other devices connected to it similarly had experienced the same process. The next day, very early in the morning, Anakin had made his way towards his mother's room with no interference whatsoever. During the night, Qui-Gon and himself had been given some rooms, and obviously he had a very luxurious room made especially for him. I don't intend to make Tatooine my true capital, because it lacks things for my plan. But that doesn't mean I will just leave it to the wolves. For now though, it will have to do. Coming across what was his mother's room, he makes sure to sense through the Force, if she is currently doing anything not very ladylike. All clear. Entering unannounced Anakin sees his mother whom is wide awake as she is currently watching some news. Of course it was the news created here from the Skywalker Industry subsidiaries talking about everything locally happening on Tatooine. Who is it? No one would be allowed to enter not unless they were authorized beforehand, and they certainly would not be able to enter when she was in a bad state, again only if authorized. Guess who? Anakin says out loud, his voice now deeper than the last time they had met. Turning around Shmai finally gets to see her intruder especially because there is no known male that should be allowed into her room. Arnie. That would be me. Jumping out of her seat she rushes over to embrace him. Calm down there. You are back. Shmai said relived before continuing in a questioning tone. Again. Well, let me fill you in on the details. Anakin then went on to explain everything that had happened the day prior but choose wisely to leave out that he had disposed of some assassins. That did not stop him from telling her of the attack. Shmai stopped Anakin from speaking any more about the events that had occurred and started to become more personal. Enough of that. Now tell me, what have those Jedi been feeding you? I mean, you have practically grown so tall now that you are becoming quite the giant. Not to take into account that I had also seen some impressive growth. But this should be nothing to worry about. Anakin finished for her. What should be of your utmost concern however is your health. And given the current situation I have heard that you were not getting enough sleep. I'll be well. I have many responsibilities now. I can't just let the people down. That is all good and all. But you should become more selfish. That is not the Jedi way. Shmai decides to turn the conversation around and point it towards Anakin. No it is not. But who said I was going to follow everything they say directly with no pushback? Smiling, Shmai replies. I guess you would do so. She had done some research of her own, and it was not like the Jedi were all that secretive with stuff like that. How could she not look into that organization a little bit deeper, considering she had let her only child, her precious son, join up with them? They were with a lot of things. But that was not at the top of their list to cover for. You are staying out of trouble. I hope. Shmai says to Anakin. Of course Anakin says, but knows that she would see through him here. Stupid motherly or is it womanly instincts? Not. Sighing Shmai continues. Just stay safe. She still smiles very brightly. Now that everyone of importance has arrived, we should begin to call in. And if there are any last minute doubts, please say so now. Jira spoke to the room in place of Shmai, whom was also attending with everyone else that is present. I do have a question. Someone spoke from the small crowd gathered. Yes, please ask away. Jira replied. The person then asked their question. What in general do you think the huts want? Someone else spoke up here. They obviously want war to re-enslave us and get back some of their money. Some people agreed with this person's words. Obviously their goals are easy to understand. 
But that does not mean we will give in. No, I think what the gentleman over there wanted to know was what would the huts want in exchange for peace. Jira spoke. As for us, we do not want the huts to not continue to harass us after the deal is made. Jira continued. Seeing that silence had filled the room and that there were no more questions presented, Jira handed over her position to Shmai, who stood up and allowed herself to be seated in place as the main communicator between herself and the huts. Anakin was just behind his mother, while Qui-Gon was off in another part of the throne room. I think I know or understand why the Republic wants to get us under their control so badly, and why the Huts also want this place back. Anakin thought to himself being retrospective of the situation. In fact, I am surprised the Republic did not at least try to form an alliance. But considering that Sidious is currently in charge, I should not be surprised by his greed. The main reason being the Republic's insistence on the trade routes that run through Tatooine are especially important, let alone the fact that this had used to be their capital. Also having their current leader, Jabba within their prisons, most were surprised that the Huts did not immediately strike back. This was also thanks to Anakin's planning, making sure that the defensive capabilities are enough to hold back, and maybe even win. He does not have any more forces that would allow him to expand his territory past the system of Tatrine. This is one of the reasons he wishes to recreate the Star Forge. Communications begin. The effeminate voice of the communications officer called out. Establishing connection. Connecting. We are connected. Transmission will begin in 3, 2. The communications officer present then signaled that they were live with a gesture of her hand instead of completing her countdown. The screen that had been brought in started to transmit images between the hearts and Shmai, who was sitting at the front. Shmai decides to talk first and greet the crime lords. Greetings. I am Shmai Skywalker, the current and newly crowned monarch of Tatooine. She puts on a brave face that she had grown used to over the years of helping to lead a business. Technically, Tatooine isn't even considered a part of Hut spatial territories Anakin was thinking to himself as the Hut started to respond. Laughing the Hut on the other end mocks Shmai. The Agola Nachaska Shag Kui Kuni. Boo Hut's Dar Bargain, you call me Kibu Republic Stuka Yoska. Ma Peach you droid as Cheska Wasted. Stupid little slave queen. The Huts will not negotiate. You are only lucky the Republic looks out for you. So two your droids are many. In outrage, the room explodes because of the insult. Because most here understands and knows the Hatties language, they were easily able to know without a translator droid present. Anakin also obviously doesn't like that, but would let it slide for now. The discussion then continued for a while, not breaking its stalemate, and it would seem that the Huts were stalling for time, and not making their demands known. While Shmai tried to steer the conversation, but unfortunately not getting anywhere to where they would like to be. After a while the communication was cut and the people had to continue their own business as the next transmission would take a while to start. Qui-Gon had announced himself and all, but that had also seemed to further upset the hearts. What a kind bunch they are, very friendly. Qui-Gon says sarcastically to Anakin. I would not put it past them that they should try to do another assassination attempt against my mother. Anakin said. Yes, it would seem that the attack last night was just the first attempt. Qui-Gon did not know that it was Anakin that had disposed of them, but assumed it was the droids guarding the palace. A good assumption considering the droids were also fully equipped, and would have been able to handle them, not needing Anakin's assistance at all. I do believe that we don't have much to do here, other than continuously remind the huts that the Republic would back up Tatooine, if they were to try and start a war. Anakin said. Yes, it would not be good for something like that to happen. Hello. Another voice interrupts the two conversing. Good to meet you too, you guys must be the Jedi sent here, right? The human female then continues. I am sorry. I didn't introduce myself. My name is Renala. The now identify Renala said. Yes, good to meet you. But why have you approached the two of us? Qui-Gon questioned. I just so happened to be a part of the research and development department of this planet's government, and was just interested in meeting some Jedi, as I haven't met one before. She explained her curiosity. Renala feels that there is just something about the Padawan that is familiar to her, but she couldn't quite place her finger on it. Oh well, she thought to herself before continuing. I am interested in how the powers, or abilities that a force sensitive possesses, and I am always willing to learn some more. You must be aware of the requirements to learn from the Jedi. Anakin directs to Renala curious to see what she is trying to do. Well, let's just say that I have done my research, but that doesn't discourage me from trying to find out some more about the energy field known as the Force. She then continued as everyone else was out of hearing range. I just thought that the two of you could help me out. I think not. Anakin responds shutting down whatever plan she has cooked up, given that there is much more important business to attend to at the moment. I think I should give her a good spanking, with a very convincing expression that showed her disappointment she said. Oh well, it was a nice try anyway. Maybe we could see each other more often, or discuss these matters at some other time perhaps. Renala says before walking away. That was interesting. Qui-Gon says to Anakin about their interruption. Yes, very. Anyway what is our objective here again? To make sure a war doesn't start. 
but the main goal for us being here is to protect your mother for the duration of our stay. Kwai Gon stopped before continuing, meaning that we will stay here to protect her from harm and try to negotiate as well before going back. I think that would be rather impossible. Anakin says thinking about the heated situation. Maybe, but it doesn't hurt to try. Anakin then responds. I guess not. A few days had passed and the assassination attempts did not stop even though they had failed multiple times, further prolonging both Qui-Gon and Anakin's stay. Thankfully it was not like he needed to be anywhere else at the moment, not of any importance more than what is happening here. At least I get some quality time with my mother, and get to see with my own eyes the progress Tatooine has made. Anakin thought to himself while meditating within his room. Thinking about the situation, with the amount of allies Tatooine has which would be very small, Anakin could only see to it, that he gets his mother and the people of Tatooine to settle for an alliance with the Republic for now. There is no other way around it. With his current military might, it would be incapable of fully holding off the huts for long enough to where he could be good for a while. His current standing army may be able to last a while, but it would not be long enough, at least from the projected figures, that the Star Forge would be up and ready to help compensate for his lack in that area. The economic situation was actually going very well, even with the low amount of population here on Tatrine. He had no worry about income, because the business on Tatrine and Skywalker Industries can sustain the market. The politics of the situation are actually not that complicated, because the head of the entirety of Tatrine's leadership is his mother, where she can make the executive decisions. Everyone acts more like advisors, but they do have their own areas of interest, meant to keep them busy in building up Tatrine. The people seem to be content with what they have, at least for now they can live proper lives and be free from slavery. Implants, if any within slaves were immediately taken out of them through the temporary medical stations put up. In fact a lot more escapee slaves were coming to Tatrine if they had the chance because of its very advanced systems here, that allow for that sort of escape. When thinking about the crime rates here, it was very low considering everyone here has all of the basic necessities to live. But of course once the population starts to increase, crime may increase as well. Arnie, may I come in? The voice of his mother comes from the other side of the grand and majestic door towards his room. Yes, you may enter. She enters the room and is once again amazed by the architecture within. The droids sure were well motivated. Shmai thought to herself as she entered. I have something to talk to you about. And it is about that Queen of Naboo. Shmai drops the bomb, raising his right eyebrow. Anakin shows some surprise on his face, not expecting that Pan would contact his mother. Well, what did she call you for? I was quite surprised at first to discover that the Queen was one in the same as Pan, with whom we had meet here on Tatooine, within a starter shop. This definitely surprised me. She had wanted to help because she wanted to return the favor, but I felt it was a little more than that. Shmai says the last part out loud not intending to speak her thoughts but she did before continuing. Myself and her had created a special treaty between the two of us, and considering how close we are to each other, I thought that the idea was great. Shmai stopped for some breath before continuing. At first I had liked the help provided as it had accelerated in making up for the things I would have missed out on in my new position. In exchange a non-aggression pact was made. That is interesting, but I don't think that is all. You are correct. This non-aggression pact was only meant to be a disguise, so that Padman and myself would be able to communicate with each other more often. Of course that was the real reason, Anakin thought to himself, but soon after that, it would seem that there was cause for the both of us, Nabu and Tatrine, to enter a much closer relationship. Anakin's interest was captured here. This pact had been taken up to another level with making a full alliance. Of course this has not been made public just yet, and the decision between both parties is still in negotiation. But it would seem that some of the people on Nabu are trying to pressure Pan into making a deal that includes herself as a subject. Shmai then finished. They wish to have Pan be married to you, Ani. Now this is something Anakin was not expecting at all and it was as if the force itself was playing a joke on him. No way, Anakin so elegantly replied. Yes way, Padme has had her suspicions that the people pushing this specification are doing so under the orders of someone else, but can't find out by who. Well, I am sure that being within a high political position of power, one would make some enemies. Anakin then thinks within, directly or indirectly, in fact this may be the doing of Palpatine to further increase his control over the situation. He no doubt considers that Padme is someone still so easily ready to accept anything he says. What Anakin had deduced is true. Palpatine was trying to move as many pieces as he can to further establish himself throughout the galaxy, and he believed by trying to turn Anakin away from the Jedi back to his mother would help him. By doing this he would be much easier to manipulate, and then he could potentially bring Tatooine and possible systems next to Tatooine into his control. Arnie, don't you think it's terrible? Shmai said. Well, if I had not known that you would think I am not that good of a match for the Royal Queen of Naboo, I know now. Anakin replies in jest. Glaring, she responds. That is not what I mean, and you know it. In fact, I believe that you could have as many wives as you would like. It is not like the people here or anywhere else would not accept. 
Shmai tries to tease Anakin back. So my people are pervs, are they? Don't let anyone else catch you saying that. The two then burst into laughter at their ridiculous back and forth. It was nice seeing you once again Anakin, if only you could visit more. Technically the last time I had come I was not supposed to come. I took a calculated risk coming. And this time it is supposed to be on official Republican Jedi business. Anakin pauses. But, Shmai knows he has more to say. EUT told her that doesn't stop me from coming back to you. Smiling, Shmai embraced Anakin within a hug. It is good to see you too, mum. Anakin finishes while thinking. Now I have some more problems to deal with. Thankfully there is a solution to the current stalemate. Making an alliance with the Republic and convincing them that this is the best decision instead of being forcefully integrated. Anakin then continued his thoughts. It should not be too hard to make sure all of the politicians go with my terms. It was simple enough getting some blackmail material. Plus bribing the members would just as easily sway them over to my side. Or should I say my mother's side? I think we should both head to bed. Anakin said to Shmai who is still hugging him. Let me stay. Sighing happily, Anakin replies. I guess we could sleep together. Coruscant. Anakin had to very often remodel and upgrade his Vader suit. Because he was constantly growing himself. It would be a while before he stops and would be able to finalize his Vader suit. But that doesn't matter for now. What does matter however, is that Tatooine needs a representative within the Senate. And what better person than Lord Vader, whom holds the rank of a general on the planet of Tatooine. How would Anakin do this when he was all the way on Tatooine, and could not disappear as easily as he did the last time? He could take control of a droid, and use it to put on the Vader suit, that he has a connection to again, just like his droids through Mekaderu, practically making it possible for him to be at multiple places at once. Using one of his multiple thought processes, he quickly takes control of one of the droids on Coruscant and gets others to help it put on the suit. On Tatooine, Anakin was seated within his room and had made sure that he would not be interrupted because he would need to use a device to make sure his voice is modulated and heard through the Vader suit. Complete lockdown and with the droids helping him both on Coruscant and Tatooine, he was ready to make his way towards the Senate building, the most corrupt place that could be found within the galaxy, at least currently. Make a perimeter guard around me. Vader's modulated voice comes through. We are to go towards the Senate building. Roger, Roger. One of the droids responded while he controlled the one within the Vader suit. The Republic does not need to help out some backwater place in the outer rims. A random senator within the hall called out. Palpatine was seated within the center in his new position as the Supreme Chancellor along with his aides, and his somewhat recently created Red Guard. This body agrees. Another yells as chaos ensues just as it had when the invasion on Naboo was taking place. Quiet. Everyone now settle down. There is much to discuss, and I assure you all that the distant planet of Tatooine will get representation soon enough. Palpatine spoke with an amplified voice so everyone would hear him. Everyone starts to calm down as Palpatine exercises his power and influence over the Senate. Now that everyone has become more civil, I believe that it is time to introduce yourself. Palpatine also subtly says out loud while looking towards the lone figure of Vader. Moving forward with the platform beneath him stabilizing the droid body he is in control of, Vader ominously casts a metaphorical shadow that seizes the hearts of the politicians. I have come here to the Republic as the representative for the people and leadership of Tatooine. Silently whispers were heard throughout the hall. Some derogatory towards Vader. Some surprised but mostly curious as to who he is. Continuing, Vader speaks. My name is Vader. My title is Lord, and my rank within the government of Tatrine would be equivalent to a general. Exclaiming Palpatine begins to speak. General Vader, how interesting of you to join us here today. Everyone here is awaiting what it is you have come here to say. Coming forward, Vader proclaims. The Huts have been pressuring the sovereign planet of Tatrine into capitulating into their demands, and the Republic has provided some assistance. But that will not be enough to have us join the Republic. We wish to remain independent. A prawl was heard as this was not going according to their plan to bring them into their authority. It was most certainly not going the way the Sith, Sidious had wanted it to go. After the crowd calmed down a bit, Palpatine questioned. And if I may ask the respective, Lord Vader, why is it you have come here today if not to join the Republic? I have come to declare that Tatrine will not be joining. But a treaty can be made to accommodate and help facilitate healthy relations. What Vader had just said now increased the interest of those present. The representative from the Trade Federation steps up after being given permission to ask a question. Will this sovereign state allow the Republic access to their trade routes? Money on their mind, of course they would ask one of the most important questions at the top of their minds. Yes, this can be arranged within the treaty. After a long while of debating back and forth with the Republic, the plants by Sidious and those who are actually good politicians, everything had been all but signed. Ready, everyone was to conclude this drawn out process. Good, if that is now over. I suggest we call a vote to see whether or not that we as the Republic should accept the terms. Palpatine called as everyone had slowly come around to the terms within the contract. One last time I will call out the main articles of the treaty. Palpatine's aide took over as he took a seat. The sovereign planet and system of Tatooine will allow the Republic special sanctions within the trade routes and hyperspace lanes. 
that they would be in control of. The Galactic Republic will not be in control in any way over the actions taken by the sovereign planet of Tatooine or their leadership. They will remain an independent state where an alliance is to be made. The Galactic Republic will only assist the sovereign planet and system of Tatrine in the event of an attack against their people. Only in the event of defensive action could action from the Republic be taken. The sovereign planet and system of Tatrine will not need to participate in any wars, whether they be aggressive or defensive in nature against the Republic's enemies. Special trade sanctions will be made to better accommodate the needs of the sovereign planet of Tatrine and their businesses here throughout the Galactic Republic. Finishing off the aid then continues. There are many more things and much more intricacies included within, but I believe that should be the basics. Does anyone here not agree to these terms and conditions? So speak now. Silence was here. Given that Palpatine had not said a word, and that the others think the conditions are fair enough, no opposition was presented. If Palpatine had made a move however it would start to plant doubts as to his rule because thankfully there was still some hope from within the politicians would be able to stop his rise. For now it would seem that Palpatine had to take a back seat, knowing that whoever this person was had done a good job in bribing or blackmailing some of the politicians here. This treaty would not have been accepted so easily otherwise. After a small while, and no one was coming forward in opposition, Palpatine's aide declared. Then it is final. This treaty shall be signed. Being the representative, Vader was given full executive power when it came to the current situation, making it completely legal for him to place his name instead of his mother's. That would be way too much of a hassle. He thought to himself. After the emergency assembly of the Senate, Vader was curiously approached by Palpatine afterwards, seemingly interested in getting to know about him. Obviously this guy just wants to manipulate me. Greetings, Supreme Chancellor. Vader's voice and imposing stature did not scare off the frail old man at all. Yes, it is finally an honor to meet such a figure as yourself. Palpatine replied with a smile on his face that seemed genuine. It is most interesting that I find myself here talking to you, but I hope that we could continue to have friendly relations. You jest, I am not someone of such caliber to be seen as such. You are, from various reports I have happened to chance upon it would seem that you played a vital role when it came to the usurpation of the hearts on Tatrine and the freedom of its people. I have played a role in what has happened. Vader pauses before continuing. What are you suggesting? I was just curious. That is all. How could someone from nowhere just appear out of the blue and have the required resources to start an entire war with the huts? Palpatine says this more to himself than to Vader. You have not only beaten them out of Tatooine and its system, you have also managed to have the manpower to repel the huts. Palpatine says, Your resources must be immense, innumerable in measure. Surely you can trust this humble old man and tell him some of tales. Like the snake in the Garden of Eden, Palpatine tries to establish a friendly bond between the two. Regale me please. I may be the Supreme Chancellor. But that does not mean I am unable to take a short break to hear of you. Vader simply replies, Just as you have said Chancellor, it is quite unfortunate that I have some things of my own to do. So, if you would be so kind, I will excuse myself. Of course, I apologize for taking up your time. No doubt you have greater issues to go about and solve. No need till we meet again, Chancellor. Vader started to walk off so as to not be seen around him much longer. Vader has his own reasons plus many others to stay away from Sheev Palpatine as much as he could. Sidious was brewing within his own mind a concoction. Interesting. To have no thoughts and no emotions would suggest to me that the thing behind the mask is either a well-trained force sensitive, or simply unique in some other way. Marza Meta, I have a plan, and I wish for you to monitor the thing known as Lord Vader, Palpatine said to his aide. Of course, Supreme Chancellor. The misled aide replied to Palpatine, and off he went on his own way to further his own machinations and schemes, while being controlled by Sidious. Joining back up with Anakin controlling the droid within the Vader suit, he was coming across many peoples walking along the Senate building of the Republic, now to safely get the suit back to the headquarters here on Coruscant. Don't want any people with curious minds to find me or the possible location of where the suit is. Anakin had many reasons to make sure the suit was not discovered to be without someone actually operating it. But that didn't mean he would not make great use of his time here. He doesn't need to get back to the mission right now anyway. It is Qui-Gon's turn to stay on guard anyway. It was not like Anakin had no way of being able to monitor the situation with his mother anyway, considering his connection to everything that is mechanical in nature here on Tatooine. Thankfully the Force signature that was given off of the droid was a normal one only because he is using it as a vessel, otherwise the people around might start to feel the pressure of his uncontrolled energies. Overall, everything went great. Anakin had achieved his goal. Now he only had to deal with the hearts, and make sure that they never would be able or even have the chance to invade. But that type of power is a little whiles away from his current position. Tatooine, I do hope that he hasn't gotten himself into any trouble. Shmai said to no one in particular. Coming out of nowhere, Qui-Gon interrupted her. Well, I would say he has only recently gotten himself into a lot of trouble. Shmai slightly surprised calms down once she recognizes it is only Qui-Gon. You scared me, you should be careful approaching a woman like that, no doubt. 
I will learn to be wary and not do such a thing next time. Awkward silence overtakes the two as they both do not have much to say to each other. But Shmai being the brave and curious woman she is, she starts a conversation between the two. So you said something about Anakin getting himself into some trouble. Being honest Qui-Gon replies. It was his actions of coming to Tatooine to help the slaves gain freedom and get you off of the planet. That had him punished. Really? Maya Ani was punished for something like that? Shmai was starting to question why she ever allowed her child to join the Jedi. As if sensing her emotions and thoughts even though he could not because of Anakin's protections. He managed to get out. No, I think you are misunderstanding the type of punishment dealt. He was mostly only reprimanded and was only given some minor tasks to complete before being able to leave the temple again. Slightly relived, Shmai continues. That is good then. Being reassured that her child was not being severely reprimanded slightly relived her. But she still had some doubts. Tell me, Jedi Master, he is safe there is he not? A silly question one might ask considering the type of work the Jedi do. But that type of adventurous and dangerous encounters generally only happen with graduated knights. He is, and if you are wondering about his friends, from what I have heard he is quite popular among those of his peers and younger. Qui-Gon then continued after pausing. In fact he is quite popular with older students as well. Of course, Mayani is doing well. Shmai thought to herself, and was rather proud of her son even though he had not really accomplished anything that was too great since joining. In fact there were things he had done that was not a part of the Jedi, and distinctly had him going against their rules, just so he could actually accomplish something. Unaware of Shmai's thoughts or doubts, Qui-Gon continues. Anakin is fine, as my apprentice I should be able to protect him from most if not all harm. You should also have some faith within your own child. I do. Shmai replies very quickly with no hesitation. I did not say you didn't. It was another monotonous day within the Grand Skywalker Palace on Tatooine. Again they would wait for the huts to once again be connected with them, so they could try and further progress. But it would seem they were hell bent on not allowing a resolution be made, and were continuously increasing tensions, so something drastic could happen. The huts were waiting for something. That much everyone was aware of, and a lot of people at this point, assume that it has to do with the assassination of the Queen. Is it going to be yet another boring day, Master? Anakin questioned Qui-Gon with a hint of weariness in regards to the constant denial of peace. You should not worry, my young apprentice. I am sure that by now or at least within the next few days, the Huts would finally give up in their pursuit. Qui-Gon says with certainty, I am sure. Anakin replies with some sarcasm. The real reason that Anakin had discovered the Huts were delaying was because they were waiting for their informant and spy within the Tatrine territory to make their move. Unfortunately, it was quite hard to see through the thoughts of every single person here. But with enough time he should be able to identify the traitor soon enough, because he has been busy analyzing the minds of those within the palace and clearing them one by one. A slow process, but one that was guaranteed to root out the Impister. After a while, everyone had gathered back within the throne room specifically at the center, where a table had arisen from the center, that contained an advanced artificial intelligence network that held all sort of information. What this center was being used for currently was dedicated towards the process of communicating with the hearts and the accumulation of knowledge within this AI's nexus. It is much harder to find this spy than I had originally thought it was going to be. Anakin had been at it for days now and was having trouble. No matter patience is the only thing that will help me here. For now, now, let us begin the briefing before we again try to gain some peace with the hearts. Jira again spoke for Shmai at this moment as she usually did before negotiations started. Jira was quite the avid talker, it would seem. When will this end? It has been days now, and they don't seem to be giving up or letting in. In fact, I believe that we have given them a lot of concessions that they would have loved to keep or to have had. Someone within the crowd spoke a bit dissatisfied with the way things were going. Trella, Anne and Tan were off to the sides as they were being trained to become close attendants for Shmai, and were meant to act as companions and guardians if the situation calls for it. Don't get Anakin wrong here, he knows his mother has actually become a little bit capable in defending herself, because he kind of influenced her to at least get good with some type of weapon. If she had no means to defend herself then the next best option, no the first option should be that she should run. When it comes to life and death situations, it is always best to try and run, because you could not only avoid having your own life threatened, but you do not put yourself at further risk when trying to defend against an attacker. Going on a tangent as he drowns out the arguing coming from the crowd, Anakin thinks back to the times in his previous life where there were people who believed they were the heroes of the story when in fact they were simple background characters. Trying to fight violence with violence usually leads to a bad ending. Sometimes it may be necessary, but most of the time the easiest, quickest, safest and most effective method for survival is to run. I think that is enough arguing for today. Shmai calls out finally getting annoyed and anger leaks into her voice. 
when usually she is portrayed as kind. You know you have gone a bit too far once even the nicest and kindest of people get angry. Shmai sitting back down on the throne dressed in a quiet high quality garb looks over the crowd. Now, I think that is enough for today. I believe it would be best if we do not talk about the subject matter, and only wait for the hut's transmission. Silence is spread throughout, portraying just how docile the people within were when it came towards Smy. Smiling, she decides to follow with a treat after giving the stick. Thank you, I apologize for my outburst, but I stand firm that fighting amongst ourselves in this moment will not help us any. Instead of more silence, Smy is met with some cheering and applause to her words. Man, the people here have quite the fanaticism. Anakin was starting to worry that maybe his living droids were having some kind of impact on the people. Denying within, he continues his thoughts. Nope, they couldn't possibly be going so far as to subconsciously convert everyone around, could they? Anakin again can't be everywhere at once. Because he is not only limited to his singular body, but is also limited to his thought processes. It may be slowly growing with time, but that doesn't mean he is omniscient just yet. I will get there, with time. The transmission screen in the middle finally flickers to life as the huts begin connecting. Everyone finally could release a sigh, knowing that the huts will still continue to communicate with them. But they still are saving a sigh of relief. Hoping, just hoping that the huts agree to some peace. The tutor, Shag Kui Kuni, and Shag Mickey Yunas. Hello, Slave Queen and Slave Peoples. Even after the pleasantries exchanged between both parties, mostly the Tatooine party in particular, it would seem they would not give up on addressing Shmai and those within the room as such. It didn't matter if some of them weren't even slaves. What did matter whoever was that they were all the same, and would be treated as such by the huts. Greetings to you too, Shmai replied. I would like it that we could actually finally negotiate some terms to a treaty of sorts. I wish to further avoid conflict impossible. Bu huts wa hei bed rietik ki bu republics lovely. And while Elaine knew bed, Tagwatish Bu bargain, the huts have come to know of the Republic's meddlings, and have decided to agree with the peace negotiations. Strange Anakin thought to himself, the huts are giving up a little too easily. The hut on screen was acting a bit suspicious. Again, everyone within the room even though offended, held back their anger relived that the huts will finally not go after them anymore. This is a little too easy. Shmai speaks out the thoughts of some people. I wish to know the specifics that has led to your decision. Bu Hut Simjo Apps Marsi Naga Bedbo's G Moa Republic. The Huts simply don't wish to go against the Republic. The Hut negotiator replied with a subdued smugness within their voice, unnoticed by all but a few. After a short discussion that actually went places an actual agreement was made and was written and signed off by the leader of the Huts. With a lot of disadvantages lodged against them, the people would at least figure that they would get something out of this. The only condition posed was that the main recipient and person responsible for upholding this treaty was Shmai, which was incredibly suspicious. She did not ask for any other extra conditions except peace. So that could be one of the reasons for their easy dismissal. But to this degree, Anakin thought to himself, Anakin, I don't believe the Huts are actually forfeiting this. Qui-Gon spoke to Anakin after the discussion had finished. I am getting the same feeling. It seems that they are planning something, but I am unsure as to what that is. Anakin responded, For now, I think we should stay here on Tatooine for a little while longer but we should report back to the council that we are leaving. Create a distraction of sorts, Anakin suggests. Sounds like a plan, it would certainly lead any snakes out of their caves. Qui-Gon agrees but has something else to say. I am afraid though that the council made us like this idea, considering everything has seemingly been finished here. I am sure that they would see it from my way. Or should I say see it from the perspective of those from Tatooine, its people? Anakin continued. Anakin would then go on to explain the situation with the Council and Qui-Gon, backing up his decisive moment, letting him finish. The Council would then agree with little argument because of the things he had mentioned, particularly in regards to the mysterious Sith. They were still searching for this figure after all, and Anakin was more than happy to spread a few lies here and there to ensure his mother remained safe. To make sure his newly constructed future empire will not crumble down because of some schemes lead in the background. They had finally left those despicable people from the Republic. Some, a lot of them. Someone thought ominously safely away from the mind-reading Jedi. It would seem that an imposter was among the people of Tatrine, and was now currently stealthily moving through the still being reconstructed streets of Mos Espa. Soon enough it would be renamed into something that included the Skywalker somehow. The people are twisted here. This this person thought they had seen far too much and was ready to bail, but was unable to do so, because he was approached by someone that offered him great power and riches, freedoms like none other would experience. He was going to report back to this being about the progress of his mission, within a dark alleyway, yet to be touched by Anakin's construction droids and no one else had gone towards, because it needed to be renovated, the person threw the buildings and rubble to a specific area. Not all criminals escaped, and not every criminal was known to Anakin because what they had done was something not recorded ever, anywhere. Or they were simply not important enough, and only did basic grunt work. The lowest of the low in the criminal hierarchy, lifting his transmission device that was 
was on a secure channel hidden away by the systems in place, a blind spot because of the amount of rework that needed to be done. The shadowy figure activates the device. My lord, I have to report to you my findings. The shadowy figure said rather weirdly. Good. On the other end was a holographic figure cloaked in black not unlike a Sith. Not unlike the same people who had initiated the attack on Nabu years ago. You have done well, and shall be rewarded, for now tell me what was happened. The shadowy figure then went on to regal his lord about the events and juicy details of what had happened for the next few minutes, summarizing the situation. My lord, is that good? Have I done well? The shadow asks. You have done splendidly. You surely will be appropriate to join me in the making of history. What both of these dastardly scum and villains do not know of however, is that this was all a part of Anakin's quick thought up plan to root out the cause. Looking through a specialized droid that would have originally belonged to the monks that had been expelled from their home, Anakin was appropriating their technology for his own uses. Let's see, from this distance I am unable to truly make out who these two people are, but that is fine. Anakin would be able to capture the one cloaked, because he was physically here. He had a great guess that Palpatine would be the other one on the other side of that connection. But his suspicions aside, it would be prudent to take him down first, and then ask questions later. Watching the sneaky shadow, Anakin waits in anticipation for his prey to finally turn off the device. And while he is at his most vulnerable and unguarded moment, he will swoop in for the metaphorical kill. Thank you, my lord. The shadow just about shouts allowing for Anakin to hear that sentence through the device. But he was close enough nearby to move in. If that fails, meaning if he fails to apprehend him, Anakin has his droid setting up a perimeter, thus surrounding the shadow from any hope of escape. Thankfully there are also no advanced underground networks or tunnels underneath Mos Espa. Be quiet. The holographic cloaked figure hissed. You are in a secure area are you not? Yes, my lord. I swear it upon my life. You and I better hope so. From what I have gathered the people here on Tatooine are strangely passionate in protecting not only each other, but especially anything to do with the royal family. The holographic then continued. If word was to get out, I will be denying your existence. You wouldn't want that now would you? He left his words trailing to build suspension. No, my lord. I would never do anything that would put you into a dire situation. The shadow continues to say in a loud voice, as if to prove not only his allegiance, but that he is a very secure area, safe from the eyes and ears of those on Tatooine. E-O-O-D tilde just remember to stay vigilant, and those whom you would like revenge on will suffer. Says the holographic cloak being further conversing in a manner not unlike the snake in the Garden of Eden. Yes, my law. Dash the communication is cut off before he could finish. E. The person gets up and slowly unwinds himself moving back through the streets of Mos Esper, and when coming into the light, the side of the properly reconstructed city, the hood comes off. The shadow was revealed and it was Bob, the dissident rebellion member that harbored hatred towards Anakin and towards any who would defend him, upset with the direction of things. At the fact he was not given any position of relevance, this was his way of getting back at his would-be enemies. The Skywalker dynasty shall fall. Those would probably be his last thoughts, given the very next moment he was knocked unconscious. Well, that deals with the first part. Anakin says as some droids come up around him to take Bob away. Within a dark room, stone-cold metal was everywhere. There was minimal to absolutely no light to illuminate the place at all. But the distinct sound of breathing could be heard within the silence. Every now and then a small sound could be heard that was extremely dim, something akin to a laser. A groan is heard, and the voice of a man is heard. Where am I? His voice sounded tired, wincing in slight pain that emanates from the back of his head. The man was trying to make out his surroundings while having a pounding headache. Hey, you, you're finally awake. A voice comes from the darkness speaking to the man that was just unconscious. Surprised the man responds in panic. Abu, who are you? It would seem that you have done some bad things. The mysterious voice trailed off creating tension. Some things that are not to brighten that go against the people of Tatooine. The voice continues. Against the royal family. No. You have it all wrong. You have the wrong guy. The defeated man denies. I have done nothing wrong. I have fought for my people, the slaves. I have done all I can to help and had continued to do so, even after the rebellion was over. Silence spreads throughout the dark room as the man finished, and the voice did not respond, until. There is evidence of your betrayal. Evidence. The man questions the voice within the darkness, or is it the darkness itself? A traitor. An impostor among your people. The voice echoed. The very same people who you had helped, the very same people that had helped you in return. Some with no thought for their own safety, only that you become free. Feeling a bit guilty the man responds. No, I was there. They despise me. I am unloved and unrecognized for my efforts. You are and have always been watched. The things you have done recorded. The voice replied. There is no free meal in this world. Your personality, your character, your traits, skills and beliefs 
have led you down this path. I am not worthless. The man was just about crying and slowly mentally breaking down. Nothing is said, and the only sounds emitted throughout the dark room was from the broken man on the ground. You have failed your people. You have failed those around you, your friends, your family. You have failed yourself. The darkness if one was to visualize looked as if it was alive. And your punishment for putting the risk, the danger of the unknown, and having set the eyes of our enemies is death. The man's sobs turn into chocks as if he was being held by something. Do not worry, your death will be swift but you are needed alive for a short time. The voice that came from the darkness said, slowly the room starts to become illuminated in light as the darkness recedes into something, and out from the darkness is a man. Anakin comes from the darkness as it recedes in on himself. Quite a cool new technique I have created. There were a lot of other abilities Anakin had found would be useful to his arsenal, one being the ability to convert the essence of another into his own power. The ability to feed on the negative emotions of others too empowered himself. Another ability we wished to test on poor old Bob here was Force Drain. He had been trying to recreate this ability, but he had no test subjects to really test on. Now he could start and maybe start using some of the more horrid criminals still within Tatooine and on Coruscant when he goes back. I lied, your death will not be as peaceful as it should, but don't worry, as compensation I will look after your family. Anakin directed to the choking man named Bob. As much as one may use the force to bolster the wills and strengths of others, the reverse is possible, though not often used. Instead of sending one's will through connections in the force, instead such connections are drawn upon, fed upon, and drained completely. Anakin thought to himself about the idea behind force drain. It is a technique that is almost as old as the Sith themselves. It is a means of severing connections between life, the force, and feeding upon the death it causes. It cannot be taught. Anakin went over the methods of gaining the ability in his mind. It can only be gained through instinct through experiencing its effects firsthand. At first he had to find a way to gain this so-called experience needed to recreate the effects. But there was no one that he knew of that would be safe enough to learn from. Unfortunately he also did not have the time to travel to some Sith temples outside of Coruscant but would do so in the future. So that was out the window not taking into account that even though recorded it is possible he would still be unable to recreate it. If you would excuse me. Within Anakin's hand lightning or electricity starts to circulate as he charges up the dark side of the force. His eyes do not turn to the yellow-red corrupted version of the dark side, because he has achieved a balance, meaning he does not need to commit fully only to one side to access restricted abilities. Moving his hand towards Bob's face, Anakin starts the process of trying to create force drain. Cries of pain are heard before Bob's body starts to go through a change, withering, decaying slowly and slowly until there is nothing left but mostly skin and bones. This is quite the evil technique. Anakin could feel it. He could feel the way the Force itself reacted to his command, to his order to drain the man of his vitality, and his connection to the Force making him die. Anakin had already gone into his mind before he dies and grabbed any and all relevant memories, before he continued with his experiment. Let's see here. Dropping Bob's body on the ground, Anakin looked at the results. Inefficient Force drain is a great ability, and it seems like I was successful in recreating it. But it is limited. Way more limited than I believe it could be. But for now it will do, as it is a start. Anakin speaks out loud. Come in and examine the corpse. I want to see what the effects are. A medical droid comes out seemingly excited and exuberant in the presence of Anakin. My Emperor, your will is my command. The medical droid replied. In came a few other droids to carefully lift up the corpse and move it towards the medical research area. No, I believe it is time to go back. We can expect to be surprised by what is going to happen next. At least everyone will be surprised, somewhat. While I will have to act like I am. It was the next day since the treaty had been signed, and the people were much more relieved. With their guards lowered because the pressure from the huts has basically become non-existent. Within the streets one would be able to tell the difference in their postures, as if a weight had been lifted from their shoulders. One weird thing to take of note was that while everyone was currently very relaxed, the droids were anything but. Within the information network, Anakin had spread the information he had retrieved, and had every droid go on alert throughout Mos Espa. Of course the droids did not look any different from their usual selves, just that there was more of them out within the streets, and everyone was none the wiser. Maybe a few observant people noticed this weird occurrence, but it did not create any unease. What a great day to be alive, Anakin said out loud as he walked through the streets of Mos Espa. This place should get a new name soon. It would, most of the residents now were brewing within their own thoughts and ideas. Excited for the next part of their new lives, near totally fear from the concerns of the galaxy. Grievous was walking alongside Anakin. You know, my prince that the people here are actually very devoted towards you. I know. In part this is because of the living droid's influence. I have actually gotten a good laugh out of the propaganda the droids try to give out. Propaganda. I guess that is fine, as long as they don't take it too far. I don't mind having the people be more loyal to me. I am in agreement. The droids have done splendid work. 
And well with the year everything around the planet should have changed. Grievous continued. A capital perhaps for your empire? Yes and no. Tatooine is not suitable enough for my standards as a capital. So you have something else in mind? Yes, you have been learning a lot about the Force itself. From myself and the information I leave to you and I assume you might have come across the idea of vergences or a nexus through the Force. I know of what you talk about. A planet that has such a nexus would have to become the capital. If I may ask, why exactly do you need a nexus? It will help me and others within the Force. Why not just create one? Grievous questioned. If I created one, it would be a beacon to every other Force sensitive out there to come and find out what is going on. The location would be readily revealed. And I would have no way to hide such a thing or even protect it fully. Anakin said, I might do so in the future, but for now we would have to set up base somewhere else. Anakin continued. The two continued to walk around being created by the locals and others that had just come to Tatooine being escorted to special medical centers to remove implants or otherwise be checked for diseases and the such. Healthcare is a part of the government and has been properly implemented as of now and it was only made all the easier with proper medical information and network droids and the living medical droids as well to learn, develop and prosper. There you are, Qui-Gon calls off from the distance as Anakin and Grievous comes to a stop. Oh, General Grievous. Qui-Gon greets the Cybic first, then directs towards Anakin. I was looking for you. It would seem that nothing much has happened. Are you sure you could fulfill your promise to the Council? Of course, the presence of the Sith is here. Anakin was not lying, and he would not be surprised if Palpatine didn't send someone to help out with the attack that is to come. Well, I will trust in your instincts then. Qui-Gon replied. What are you two doing out here anyway? I was showing the Prince his people and the progress they have made after their successful rebellion. Grievous responded. Curious, Qui-Gon responds. Oh, and how has that gone? I think the people here are doing quite well for themselves but it still seems like more progress could be made. Anakin said, It would seem that this place needs more than a retexture. The people have gone through a lot, and would need to have other services available. Any ideas then, your royal highness? Qui-Gon says with some jest. Well, from what I can postulate, most people that are slaves, might need some form of therapy to help them move on with their lives. Sounds like a good idea. Qui-Gon responds. But the most important part however is that everyone will need a stable job. But from I have seen that has been fixed or a system has been put in place to help those with a terrible financial situation. Anakin says. Thankfully educational facilities exist. Anakin continued. I didn't see any educational institutes here. Qui-Gon asks. Anakin continues. Of course not. They would be located within the buildings that belong to Skywalker Industries. We had many employees that didn't have much to do and were underqualified. So I came up with the great idea to elevate them above what they are now. Quite compassionate of you. Qui-Gon smiles. Well, yes and no. Qui-Gon is surprised by the response. Oh, then why did you do it? I did it for the reasons listed above. But it was more like a mutual beneficial relationship. By helping them, they helped me. Or they helped develop Skywalker Industries beyond what it had started as on Tatooine. That is quite wise. But not really following the light side now is it Qui-Gon said. Hey, you can't complain. I did all of this before I joined the Jedi, remember? Anakin then thought to himself. I also am still doing it. But for now no one else really needs to know as they were conversing. Some screams were heard off into the distance and an explosion that could be felt by them was located where the Skywalker Palace was. What was that? Qui-Gon questioned. Come on, I think your plan worked. He started dashing towards Skywalker Palace. Anakin looks over towards Grievous and motions with his head, getting the idea Grievous also goes off in another direction. Finally, dashing towards the palace Qui-Gon was now aware of multiple presences, moving in on the well-guarded constructed fortress. Seemingly calm and collected, he makes his way to observe the situation first to get a clear view of the attackers. What he sees doesn't surprise him all too much, but he feels as if there is more to the situation than what is led on. A dark presence can also be felt, but he could not identify from which direction it was in, so he could only take one step at a time. Where did my apprentice go? Qui-Gon thought to himself. I hope he has not gone off to get himself into some trouble again. His mother wouldn't like that. Qui-Gon catches himself thinking about Shmai. Wait, why did I think that? Shaking off his distracting thoughts he ignites his lightsaber and goes in on the attackers which were other droids themselves with a few other humans moving in towards the palace entrance. Gunfire and blaster shots were causing chaos around the palace, but there were very minimal casualties. The only things to suffer were the architecture of the palace and the droids stationed to guard outside and within. Qui-Gon deflects a blast bolt sent towards himself back towards his attacker, which was a droid. Moving fast, Qui-Gon starts to hack and slash every droid within his way, while also being careful to not destroy the droids of Tatooine. Thankfully there is a distinct marking that could be made out, 
so he would know which is enemy and foe, and he could rely on the force anyway. There was no one present but the attackers. Using the force, Qui-Gon pushes and pulls various droids and the humanoid attackers. Their weapons now forfeit, they had nowhere to go, and the droids outside were made useless because of being destroyed. We surrender, one of them said. Yes, we surrender. The attackers were dropping to their knees, while Skywalker droids were surrounding them, lifting them up and taking them away from the area towards another place. Before they could all go off however, Qui-Gon identified the attacker's leader and stopped the droid from taking him away. Stop, I will be taking this one. The droid does a salute. Roger, Roger. The droids take away their prisoners, while Qui-Gon is left behind to deal with the leader, to quickly interrogate him, then move on and find the queen. Now, tell me what you know a few minutes after a small interrogation, Qui-Gon was easily able to identify what was lies, and what was truth, and knock the attackers out, then proceeded to restrain him. Now to see what is inside. Some sounds of gunfire could be heard, and every once in a while there was some silence before more sounds were heard. I better get a move on then. Qui-Gon gets ready to dash inside after noticing that there was nothing else to take care of from outside, and the intruders within were probably the last ones to be dealt with. Let's hope I get to keep my other hand this time. Qui-Gon takes a step into the palace entrance. Shmai Skywalker was many things. At first she was but a simple girl who was abducted from from her home and moved from her parents, enslaved to the will of others, incapable of doing many things. Because of the things that had happened to her, this only made her stronger. Then she was a mother, out of nowhere she now has a child. After that she became the owner of a large corporation that was but a simple and small shop at the beginning. Now it has spread throughout the galaxy. Recently though she had become a queen, a position of power she never really wanted, but had some experience and leadership to deal with the situation. Right now, however she was a bit panicked because she had come under attack. She knew her position would lead to events like this, and just because she had been prepared, does not mean she is ready. Shmai, please come this way. We must evacuate the palace. It would seem that a targeted attempt at your life is at hand. Jira said as she ran in her direction with surprising swiftness for an old lady. Okay? Just give me a second. Shmai replies seeing the others, Trella, Anne and Tan, rush in with blasters within their hands. She walks over towards a compartment in her room that acts as a hidden storage device. Holding a weapon with which she could protect herself with. I may have minimal training but I have at least got the basics down. Shmai had been indirectly influenced by Anakin and as such, she had put some time and effort into educating herself about the use of weapons. I am ready, Shmai said. All right, follow us now. We will protect you. Well, we will at least try to protect you. It would seem for some reason some of the droids have gone offline. Jira replied, some of the droids were going offline because the attackers were smart enough to think up of some countermeasures. One such measure being taken was the use of a small grade EMP. An EMP perhaps. Shmai questions as her mind becomes curious about the possibilities. That might be right. But let us put this aside and continue this at a later time. We should really get going, Jira replied. The group then decides to move towards the special area constructed in case of an emergency such as this. A cave-like opening is made within the room. It heads underground and is illuminated quite well. The structure was mechanical in nature, technology at its finest right underneath the Skywalker Palace. Go on, your highness. Now is not the time to marvel at the mechanics. Trella the youngest of them all calls to Shmai. Okay? Jumping down, she lands on a surprisingly soft metal material. The others jump down after her, also surprised that the landing was quite soft, and did not hurt them at all. After getting over their initial surprise, Jiro ordered, Close the top. We don't want anyone following us down here. Anne replied, I am on it. Anne's sister Tan went with her to cover her back. Your Highness, I believe it is this way. Trella motioned for Shmai to follow her, while Jira was already in position to take off once again. A blast is heard from above, and before the twin sisters Anne and Tan were able to seal the hole, a force of power stopped it in its place. Stop right there. A dark and hate-filled voice spoke to the group within the underground tunnels. Qui-Gon had finally made his way towards Shmai's bedroom, and saw the door was destroyed. Entering the room he was able to identify the pathway they had taken, and there did not seem to be much damage. Humming Qui-Gon then thinks to himself, I I should follow. Qui-Gon jumps down while internally thinking. Something doesn't feel right. He turns around looking through the illuminated underground. Igniting his saber he slowly makes his way through. Headed in the direction he can indistinctly feel a pull within the force. No sounds could be heard other than the steps he makes, when all of a sudden his extrasensory perception picks up a threat. Dodging and dashing away he see the lightsaber of another person. Standing before him ominously is a Sith or would be Sith, and is cloaked within the energies of the dark side. Well, 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 would you look who we have here? His voice is filled with subdued anger, wearing a black robe entirely covering their features. Qui-Gon Jinn, Jedi Master of the Jedi Order, 
Your presence here is quite the disruption. Just like all fights, a discussion has to be had before it began. Who are you? Kwai Gong question guessing he would not really get an answer. But it is always better to try anyway. Who do you think I am? The red glow that came from the man's saber should give it away. You are a Sith, perhaps, but I think that is enough talking for now. The man dashes towards Kwai Gong, intending to put an end to his life. Kwai Gong parries the strike before force pushing the Sith away. Spinning the red saber around, the Sith slowly approaches Kwai Gong whilst trying to intimidate him. Kwai Gong used the saber form, form IV, named a Taru. Given that he was currently only facing off against one opponent, Kwai Gong was at his best condition right now. He had not been in any real intensive battle, and his main hand used to hold his lightsaber was actually stronger than his original. The Sith aggressively attacks, aiming to slice of his metallic hand. He again parries the blow in a defensive posture, but this further decreases his energy, given this form was extremely taxing. His opponent however was using the most versatile of forms, Form Vi, named Nyman. Form Vi attempted to balance all elements of lightsaber combat, combining the techniques from forms that came before into a less intensely demanding combat style. Meaning that it was better if Qui-Gon finished this fight sooner rather than later, considering his opponent would be able to outlast him. Ataru was an aggressive combat form, relying on a combination of strength, speed and agility. Something that Qui-Gon was slowly starting to lose over the years because of age. But that didn't mean he was incapable. Maybe, I should have taken Anakin's suggestion of using and practicing another lightsaber form. Life is all about constant evolution after all. The Sith continuously tries to be aggressive, but his form is flawed, because that is not the main way he is supposed to attack. Qui-Gon sees this and starts to rapidly attack himself, knowing that the nature of his saber techniques should pull through. The Sith's experience with a saber seemed very untapped, the potential was there but it would need to be more tempered. Easily Qui-Gon was able to gain the upper hand, as the two only dueled through their lightsabers, and the Sith was being pushed back. Deciding to taunt Qui-Gon, the Sith says once he has a moment of reprieve, don't you want to know where the Queen is? Qui-Gon pauses. What have you done to her? For some inexplicable reason a small hint of anger could be heard within Qui-Gon's voice. Having the distraction he needed, the Sith starts to build up some energy within the Force in anticipation of his escape. Oh, wouldn't you like to know? Qui-Gon decides to play along, while extending his senses to be at its highest alert. I would like to know. Too bad. The Sith uses an overpowered Force push to throw Qui-Gon across the underground hallways. I guess we will be seeing each other some other time. Oh, and what happened to the Queen? I have no clue. They had escaped from me. The Sith clicks his tongue. Stupid failure. The Sith whispers to himself. The Sith walks away as Qui-Gon gets up off of the ground. Damn. He thought to himself. I have no time to waste. I did not sense any deception within his words, which would mean they are safe. It should be safe to assume they escaped. But to where I did not know, Qui-Gon finished mentally. Walking off into the opposite direction of his opponent, the Force guides him to his destination. Oh, Sir Qui-Gon, you are here. A voice comes from the direction he is going to. But it was slightly off like it was a speaker saying it. Then a doorway opens up on one side of the mechanic tunnel. Over here, Jira calls out to him. Walking over he notices that within this small compartment, and Tan, Trella, Jira and Shmai had made themselves at home. Everything was there. It seemed like some sort of bunker. How did they escape that Sith? Qui-Gon then put his thoughts to life. Are you guys alright? Yes, we are fine and you. Shmai answered and questioned. I had come across something that clung to the darkness. And it would seem like he was after the Queen. Qui-Gon replied. Is it dealt with? Jira questioned. No, unfortunately he had managed to escape. For now we need to find out why this attack happened. Qui-Gon said. I believe it was the Hut's idea. Why would they give up so easily? It was for this, it would seem. Jira says piecing the puzzle together. Everyone now in this group were now going to set off back up to the palace. Because most if not all threats had been dealt with. Walking through the long mechanic hallways. Qui-Gon started to wonder just what all of the technology down here was for. Say, what is all of this? He questioned. It is something my son had designed to help us in rebuilding this place. Shmai did not hide this fact. Anakin. This is quite the marvel. It is no wonder Skywalker Industries had been so successful. Trella with stars in her eyes said. The prince is quite amazing. She then continued with a weirdly somewhat downtrodden expression. If only he could stay here. You should not worry too much about Anakin. He is doing just fine with the Jedi. Qui-Gon said. Is he? Why is he not here with you then? Shmai questioned him with a glare. Qui-Gon wisely decides to keep his mouth shut and not answer. Sometimes you just don't respond, especially when responding will only get you in more trouble. The group continued to make their way out, and everyone was gathering within the palace's throne room. A meeting to discuss the events that had occurred was taking place, and strangely enough, Anakin was not present. Nowhere to be found, Shmai and Qui-Gon were both becoming increasingly worried. When Qui-Gon had split off from Anakin, and Anakin had also split off from Grievous, he had made his way to a secret entrance leading to the constructed underground. This project was responsible for the uncompleted state of the reconstruction process. 
Entering the underground mechanic tunnelways, Anakin is able to reach underneath the Skywalker Palace before Qui-Gon, and was already in place for when his mother inevitably needs some rescuing. The underground is a large mechanic, engineering marvel of technology meant to act as a main computer and network, so to speak. It was as if it was a living machine itself. The artificial intelligence that his mother used and those within the palace relied on was just another part of the system. In fact, Anakin had done just that, he had created a living machine underneath. But it isn't one with a soul or anything like that. What he means by living, is that it is imbued with the Force. Non-organic midichlorians have been infused into this underground machine. The purpose, the spiritual matrix. The Force technique Anakin was trying to complete was still not finished. But that didn't mean he was unable to make a substitute, and it may be flawed. But it's better than nothing, in case any of the living droids died. He was connected to it and could see inside its virtual space. That is capable of holding the souls and consciousness of all the droids. A matrix. For now this scuffed version of it would have to do. Getting closer and closer to the entrance that his mother would come through he waited for the right time. And with nothing much better to do started to look through his connections to all of the droids. Seeing through their eyes what was going on. They were being destroyed and were doing some destruction of their own. But that didn't matter much considering that the living droids usually were not within the palace and were doing other things for him. The only versions of living droids here on Tatooine were just research and medical based. Seems like Skywalker Palace will have to go through some maintenance and repair. He thought to himself as he felt the time was near. There, go on, your highness. Now is not the time to marvel at the mechanics. The voice of a young female calls to his mother, he assumed. Okay? His mother had jumped down. But she did not see him. He was waiting within the shadows of the room, and using the invisibility feature of the Nano suit to hide himself away. The others jumped down after her, looking surprised. Chira ordered, close the top. We don't want anyone following us down here. Anne replied, I am on it. Anne's sister Tam went with her to cover her back. Your Highness, I believe it is this way. Trella motioned for Shmai to follow her, while Jira was already in position to take off once again. A blast is heard from above, and before the twin sisters Anne and Tan were able to seal the hole, a force of power stopped it in its place. Stop right there. A dark and hate-filled voice spoke to the group within the underground tunnels. The hate-filled male voice then continued, I can't be letting you guys get away now. Using the dark side energy of the force, the force user was able to use telekinesis to stop the entrance from closing and jump downwards. Stealthily, Anakin was protecting the five women that were within the tunnel, using the force to create a bounded field around each of them, so the man would unable to use the force on them. This bounded field was easily covered because the machine tunnel helped provide him with the necessary functions to hide his usage of the force. Within the tunnel it is practically filled with force-based energy, making it harder for anyone who is force-sensitive, other than Anakin to maneuver the area. He could also make it easier on others and guide them. But this would only happen later on, for now he will listen in on the conversation about to happen. Shmai being brave talked out and questioned their intruder. Why are you here? She said in a neutral but controlled tone, as if everything was within her control. As if the man quirked his eyebrows, he responded. Oh, your royal highness. Your majesty, of course I will willingly answer any and all question truthfully. The man replied with some snark as if he was in control of the situation. Shmai continued. Why are you attacking us? That is for me to know and for you to find out. The cloaked man replied and then dashed towards the girls in an attempt to grab them, but was repelled. What is this? He shouted in a surprised tone. The girls quickly turned and ran in the direction they needed to go towards not bothering to answer the man. Even if Anakin were not here to protect the five, the living machine underneath would and could recognize who was deemed as an ally, and who was deemed as an enemy. It could fully protect them even without Anakin there using its advanced defense system built into it. How would it do this? It could deploy various inbuilt turrets or energy shields to block the man's way, but it was best not to expose the secrets beneath to someone or to anyone else really. Only those who can be trusted should be in the know. The five girls underneath knew a lot of the functions underneath but they did not know the full story or the full capacity of its abilities. Getting up the man tries to run after them, but is continually stopped in place as if someone is holding him. Show yourself, he called out, but was unable to find the being impeding him. In a fit of madness the person begins to lash out, using the force to try and damage his surroundings. He is successful in doing so, but at a cost as he could feel himself being drained, slowly but surely, as if a monster was draining his life force. Anakin could see the man was starting to go a little insane, so he decided to leave this matter until Qui-Gon got here, only continuously interrupting the man in his attempts to chase after his mother. After a while the man was still going at it in a mad attempt to push through, and Anakin finally lets up because his mother and the others have gotten to safety. Anakin could also sense that Qui-Gon was nearing this place. Right now to wait to see what else this guy does. The battle between Qui-Gon and the man was intense, but it would seem his master still had the upper hand. Looking at most of the cloaked man's movements, he was flawed. Qui-Gon could tell this as well and capitalized on his weakness, forcing him into a retreat which finally allowed Anakin to move on and tell the underground system to help Qui-Gon find his way towards the five whom had escaped. 
the cloaked man that Qui-Gon had started to call a Sith, dashed back towards the entrance he had entered from. Let's follow and see where he goes. Damn it. Damn it all. The man seemed frustrated. But instead of going into madness once again he just continued on his way. Leaving the entrance, the man and Anakin following silently behind starts to leave the palace and head in another direction. Anakin tries to read the man's thoughts trying to ascertain where he would be going. But the man reveals it readily himself headed in one direction. The makeshift prison created to hold some of the prisoners of war from the rebellion. Anakin makes sure that the man doesn't try to harm any of the citizens of his planet while following, as they would not be considered acceptable casualties. At least to him, they weren't. What Anakin does think of as acceptable however is the droids. Even his living droids are deemed as acceptable, given that they have a way to store their beings, their consciousness and souls, so they could be resurrected at a later date. If they so desire, they would do so either way. But Anakin believed that giving them a choice was important. How could he fight for freedom and enslave another entirely complete race of beings that he would consider as living? The man was annoyed and every now and then, while trying to move silently, would send a small pulse of the force to harm an innocent bystander, where they would be none the wiser, but was silently protected by Anakin. The slowly calming down man didn't notice any of this, and was still single-mindedly focusing on his task at hand. Here it is. Coming across the makeshift prison, it was not that great but was good enough for now to house the scum and villainy. Walking in unhindered, he destroyed the droid station there and was quick about his work. His saber blaring to life to eliminate the unliving and going further into the various rooms and cells that one could see. I at least gave a humanitarian effort. Anakin thought to himself following after the man, and looking at the dastardly souls that looked lifeless. Of course not everyone here was treated badly. The living medical droids kept them so that they could experiment on them. In the name of the Emperor, of course. What is this place? The man spoke in disgust the further in he went, seeing that those further in were in worse shape than the ones previous. There was no pity within his voice and no care, further telling Anakin the absolute corruption the man has been delving into. Even I question my methods sometimes. Anakin constantly tried to evaluate his state of mind and being. One cannot be in balance 24-7 after all. Practicing with the Force, in fact practicing and training with anything takes time and effort. Talent matters as well. But effort is the most important part, and to stop looking back on oneself and not improving, will lead to stagnation. It could even lead to devolution and the regression of one's progress. Something the Jedi were currently experiencing themselves. The man continued until he came to a stop within the most heavily guarded areas of the cells. He easily dispatched of the droids given his abilities within the Force, and opened the sealed doors leading into the room. It is Jabba the Hutt. The state he is in was quite disgusting as well, and the man had to not look too long at the state the large grotesque alien was in. Crime Lord Jabba the Hutt, I am here to save your life. How the hell is this guy gonna move this fat slob out of here? Anakin was thinking to himself then continued. Wait, this is a good opportunity to allow this waste of resources go free. There were multiple reasons to allow Jabba's freedom. The hut had become a cripple, and would incapable of really doing anything within the future other than to stay and become waste. If anything, the hut's back at his home may just put an end to his life. Another reason was that Anakin had taken any and all useful information out of the hut already, had his medical droids do a living autopsy on the species, because he was interested in many other things. Probably the most important however is the response that if Jabba is subsequently not let go or is not confirmed to be dead, and is still within Tatooine's custody, would be to go to war. Letting Jabba go would benefit Anakin and Tatooine more than forcefully keeping him here. Using a transmission device the man communicates to someone on the other side. Bring over the ship, we are ready. He then continues as if he forgot something. And remember, be as quick but as stealthy as possible. Make sure to bring in that thing. We need to transport the poor sod. He has been left to rot and is not in the best of conditions. A few minutes go by, and a few droids walk in using a specialized device to carry the hut out, while Anakin is watching all of this go down from the shadows. Good, the master would be proud of me. The man seemed quite happy as of this moment, but for some reason feels sleepy. Wait what is happening to me? The droids that had come from the man's ship continued their work, and were basically already leaving without the man. Wait, where are you stupid droids going? I am right here. The man was mentally screaming, easily allowing Anakin to read his projected thoughts. It was Anakin holding the man down with enough force to shut him up, and using a myriad of force techniques to make sure everything was going unnoticed. Telepathically Anakin calls out into the man's mind, you will be a worthy replacement for Jabba. Growing scared the man tries to retaliate, but is unsuccessful, and can only watch as the droids leave Tatooine with the disabled Jabba. While he is left here to deal with the devil. Let me go. Anakin keeps practicing his usage of the force ability that allows him to feed off of the emotions of those around him on the man to strengthen himself. Even though this ability is meant to only give a temporary boost in power, it was always better to practice as much as he could. Especially on other force sensitive people making and giving him a much greater challenge and experience. Now, I will have to look into your mind. It may hurt. I have not had much practice into trying to develop my memory reading abilities. 
Things are quite complicated, and you will be a great learning experience. Anakin continued to mentally torture the man getting him to break and make it easier for him to intrude. Not able to say a word the man is swallowed into the darkness that emanates from Anakin, taken to who knows where. It is finally over. Anakin was within the throne room along with everyone else, discussing what had happened and about the defeated man who had not been identified but captured. Everyone was surprised when Anakin came in with the dark side user and presented him to everyone but were easily able to get over this knowing his capabilities. Qui-Gon was a bit suspicious, but otherwise didn't say anything about how he had been captured. Anakin had made sure to memory wipe the man of his interesting experiences with him, because it would cause some trouble if he didn't. Currently the Jedi on Coruscant had been contacted about the person they had captured, and a small meeting was taking place between the council members, Anakin and Qui-Gon. Successful you are. First mission congratulate I must. Yoda spoke to the holographic figures of Anakin and Qui-Gon, while the two also saw the holographic figures of the Masters, within a private room in the repaired Skywalker Palace. On the other side, Mace continued with a question. Where is this Dark Force user you have promised us? Despite his change in how he viewed Anakin, it did not mean he was going stop being a hard ass. Anakin speaks up. He has been captured and is currently being secured within Tatooine's makeshift prison. Bring this man you must. Many questions we have, Yoda said. Tell us about the current state of Tatooine and its relations with the Huts. Mace said asking for a report. Qui-Gon answered. It would seem that the Huts have given up in pursuing any hostile actions against the people of Tatooine. I assume it has to do with them getting back Jabba the Hutt. Being made an agreement has. Yoda asked. Yes. Qui-Gon answered. Then return you will to investigate much we have. Yoda continued. We will be returning shortly. There is nothing left here to do. Qui-Gon replied before the connection was cut off signaling that the conversation is over. Come on, I believe it is time that we say our goodbyes. Qui-Gon gestured to Anakin as he left the room they were given. Anakin follows after Qui-Gon as they move towards the throne room. That was always busy with people moving about. The place that had been damaged was repaired, and people were going about important and benign political matters. His mother sat upon the throne with a smile and didn't look tired at all, as if some pressure was relieved. She has to stop being this kind or compassionate. Anakin thought to himself with a small frown marring his face. Progress had been made, but it was obvious to Anakin that his mother was not fit to be a proper leader. Maybe within a business environment, but when it came to the leadership of this many people, the lives that could be affected by decisions made, it had a certain pressure to it. Weary is the head that wears the crown. Qui-Gon said as they were walking towards Smy. I did not think you would say something so wise master. Anakin said to Qui-Gon. I have seen many things and I can say that being in such a position of power is a lot of responsibility. Qui-Gon replied. I understand the meaning of what you have said, and would like to add that not everything about being in such a position is burdensome. Of course, there are all sorts of benefits to reap. Qui-Gon then continued. But still, there is much to think about when it comes to things like this. Everything has its price, and the price of being the queen seems to be a heavy responsibility. Getting philosophical Anakin sighs mentally. I am sure that my mother can handle herself. She has been doing well so far. That she has. Has. Qui-Gon left off as they had finally come close enough to hear the conversation between Shmai and those around her. Sighing, Jera continues her argument. Why are we wasting our time here talking about the cost of building these facilities? We should just build them already. Don't we have the resources for it? A random councilman replied. We do have the resources, but we are limited to where we could allocate such things and it would be wasteful to do so on just these things. People were contesting each other and sides were being formed to debate on things. Of course, Shmai could put an end to this and make an executive's decision, but what is the point in that? These people were elected by the people to help better represent different facets of the current situation on Tatooine. It would be detrimental to just throw away the opinions and perspectives of those people. All right, I think that will be enough for today. Shmai said and everyone become quiet. Weirdly enough there was a droid here. It was one of the living medical droids that had become known to the people here. Everyone was starting to notice that every now and then these weird droids had strange things occur around them. It was recently revealed what these droids were, but the full truth about wasn't disclosed, and only Shmai truly knew what they were. Living, others kind of knew as well, but didn't know the exact origins. Shmai knew that some of her protectors and medical sector was full of them, and had made the executive decision to include an elected official of their people, Anakin would have introduced them himself at some point. But it would seem his mother was adamant in including them as soon as possible. It would seem that the medical droid also dislikes being here. Anakin was laughing within his mind, imagining the expression that would be shown on the droid, if it had a face. Excuse our intrusion, Qui-Gon stated which had everyone looking towards their helpers. Yes, yes, I think the Queen has had enough for one day, Jira said, and everyone started to disperse as Jira remained by Shmai's side. Smiling Shmai greeted Qui-Gon and Anakin. Sir Qui-Gon, she moved forward to hug Anakin, and he allowed it. Public displays of affection are not really my thing. Anakin was a bit embarrassed, 
but nothing showed in his body language or facial expression. He just returned the hug. Mother, I know that you will have to return to Coruscant, but I just want you to know that I will still be here. Shmai said then looked to Qui-Gon. I am sure that you will continue to help my son. Yes, I will continue to train him. You should also be keeping him out of trouble. He basically was able to capture the person you had trouble doing so yourself. She said. Qui-Gon a bit embarrassed at the fact replied. It is because I have taught him well enough that he will soon be surpassing me if he hasn't already. I am sure Shmai finished before letting go of her embrace around Anakin. You should be going now then, and be sure to stay safe. Yes, I will. Anakin said to Shmai. You should go on ahead Anakin. Get the ship ready and I will be right with you. Qui-Gon told Anakin. Sure. Anakin left to go start up the scimitar and transport their prisoner on board. Qui-Gon then went on to have another conversation with Shmai. I am sure you have noticed that the person we had captured is quite the dangerous individual. I have. Shmai was unsure of where this was going. If you happen to come across like the man, would you make contact with the Jedi or at least the Republic? Qui-Gon asked. I can do that. It seems to be outside of my scope anyway. If I discover anything else to do with this individual, I will send this information to the Jedi through a messenger if it's sensitive otherwise I can do so in another way. Shmai replied in confirmation. I thank you. Qui-Gon responded before continuing. I can see where Anakin has gotten intelligence and compassion. Sir Qui-Gon, if I didn't know any better I would say you were trying to compliment me. Shmai replied. Coughing a little, Qui-Gon covers for himself. I did mean it as a compliment. But it was only meant as a testament to your own capabilities and your son's. I am sure. Shmai stare seems to see through Qui-Gon. Anyway, I'd best be heading off as well. May the force be with you. And if it allows it may we meet again. Qui-Gon finished. And to you as well. Shmai smiled towards Qui-Gon before he left to board the ship he and Anakin had come on. Thankfully there is just the place capable of keeping John Doe restrained. Anakin said to Qui-Gon as they were on the ship. The scimitar with the captured prisoner who had no name be given one. The universal John Doe identity. Yes. It is quite impressive the capabilities of this ship. Its experimental technology leads me to believe more and more. That you are as much as a technological genius as people have proclaimed you to be. Qui-Gon continued. I would say that I am comparing myself to others at least. Anakin replied. Yes, it was also quite funny to me that a lot of people were lamenting your departure from the industry with joining the Jedi. Qui-Gon said with some mirth in his voice. That was weird to me. I am sure there are many other people capable enough to do as I could. Anakin responded. Maybe. But you shouldn't sell yourself short here. Your talents are quite up there, not only within many things to do with technology or business, but also within the Force. Qui-Gon tried to boost Anakin's confidence. Don't get me wrong, I know of this, but I would just like to be humble here, as it makes it easier for others to digest. Jealousy is easily bred when being compared with others, and I would certainly become a target of such things. Anakin replied, Very wise of you my young apprentice. Well I have to learn something from you, now don't I? Anakin replies with some jest. A voice comes from the containment field. Will you two shut it already? You guys are driving me mad as it is with your insistent need to pat yourselves on the back. It was John Doe making a ruckus. Did you hear something master? Anakin said to Qui-Gon blatantly ignoring their prisoner. No, I don't believe I did. Qui-Gon replied going along with him all too used to his antics at this point. It must have been the wind. Anakin said while internally laughing. Don't ignore me. I am speaking and will be heard. John Doe continued trying to get their attention, which he had but was being purposely ignored. Hey, deciding to not ignore the man anymore. Qui-Gon turns to him and starts his questioning, as Anakin goes to the pilot the ship. Hello. It would seem you have gotten yourself into quite the situation. You have finally decided to stop ignoring me I have nothing to say. Weren't you just screaming out to not be ignored? Qui-Gon played on John Doe's anger hoping to lower his defenses. That is different. Anakin could sense everything that was going on and thought to himself, as they had now gone past the atmosphere of Tatooine. Is this guy at Sundir? It would seem that you are not going to cooperate. At least you could tell me your name and maybe your punishment would be more lenient. Qui-Gon was speaking from a respective angle here, because usually the Jedi just kill those who are aligned to the dark. You lie, I know of the Jedi, and that you would have me executed for practicing the dark arts. John Doe continued, a bunch of hypocrites you lot are. Qui-Gon doesn't seem to take any offense. I am well aware of the flaws within the Jedi, but you have not answered my question. I believe it would be best if you do not dodge my question. Never. I think that I will just remain silent. In fact, for what reasons under the Galactic Republic's law are you taking me in for custody? John Doe seemed to think he was going to get away with his terrorism. Anakin would make sure that he died, but he was unsure if it would be possible to make him confess to anything that could jeopardize Palpatine and his plans. You seem to be very resistant and know very well the laws of the Republic. Qui-Gon said, It seems that you have not been kept up to date on the politics between the Republic and Tatooine. Qui-Gon continued, An alliance has been made, and it was agreed that you were to be handed over to the 
Republic, or more specifically the Jedi for an in-depth investigation. Lies. John Doe screamed then whispered to himself. Impossible. That is not how the plan was supposed to go. John Doe was receding back into his maddened state of mind. It would seem you wanted to achieve much more. Qui-Gon said playing on the man's obvious mental deterioration. Raving mad John Doe continued. No. Never. I didn't fail. The fat slug was rescued, the queen escaped, and now that Arab planet is safe. Damn it. Something's wrong. Anakin thought to himself as the Force was warning him of something going wrong. Rushing back into the room Anakin calls to Qui-Gon. I think there is something wrong with him, obviously. Qui-Gon did not seem to notice anything else that was off. But Anakin was able to quickly diagnose John Doe's physical condition, and it was slowly withering. I think he is dying. Anakin stated going over in simple medical scan. How? There was nothing to give off that impression. Qui-Gon said. He may not make it back to Coruscant. Anakin replied. We will just have to see. Try to stabilize him as best you can. Qui-Gon told Anakin. Arriving back on Coruscant, Anakin rushed John Doe to the medical facility within the Jedi Temple, while obviously keeping him restrained, so to make sure he doesn't escape somehow. Later on, John Doe would be moved to another facility of high security once he stabilizes. Qui-Gon followed after him, but after checking out that everything was fine, had moved to report to the council about what was happening. The Sith that Anakin has taken to calling John Doe, seems to have entered a comatose state. Qui-Gon said to the other Jedi Masters, has the cause of the effects been determined? Mace questioned Qui-Gon. Tests are being conducted by both Anakin and Dr. Rig Nima. Qui-Gon responded. Shark T was present and was curious at that statement. I didn't know that Anakin had some expertise when it came to medicine. It is one of his more lesser known areas of talent. Mace responded here knowing about Anakin ridiculous in-depth knowledge of science in general, and its applications to real-world things. How long until we can know of the diagnosis? Jedi Master Plo Koon asked. Both Anakin and Dr. Rig Nima didn't say. Humming first before saying, Yoda starts. Have patience we must. Master Yoda is right, for now Anakin can stop monitoring the prisoner, while we have Dr. Rig Nima take over. He can get back to his own training. Mace said, I believe that would be for the best. I agree. Qui-Gon responded. The council then went on to talk about other matters that didn't include the supposed Sith they had captured, but they would touch upon this topic a few times before their meeting would end. Qui-Gon and Mace would stay behind after everything was finished, of course Qui-Gon was not a part of the council, so he had to come back at a later time. After they were finished but after it was done the two would begin their discussion. Their discussion about Anakin, their shared apprentice. What is your evaluation of his performance? Mace asked Qui-Gon while they walked the grand hallways of the Jedi Temple. Taking a moment to collect his thoughts, Qui-Gon replies. From what I have seen, I would say that he has come a long way in a short amount of time. So you are suggesting he has already gone past the Padawan period of his time as a Jedi? Mace asked also thinking somewhat of the same thing. Yes, I do believe when on the mission we were both assigned on. I could tell that he didn't need to be directed and could take care of himself. Qui-Gon said. That alone wouldn't imply his readiness. Mace continued. I want to ascertain whether or not he is ready to become a Jedi Knight. He is quite young to be going through and advancing so fast. Qui-Gon said with some concern. I am sure you are aware that his age shouldn't be a factor considering his capabilities, mincid and physical stature. In fact from what you have just told me, he is readily capable enough of taking care of himself. Mace continued. Qui-Gon replied. That is true and in doing so. It would make him the youngest ever to become a knight, far surpassing all others before him. You are the one who suggested he may be the chosen one, and it would seem he lives up to some of that prophecy. Mace stated. You got me there. So, what other assessments could be made about a young apprentice? Mace asked Qui-Gon of his thoughts. Humming to himself as they continued to walk aimlessly only to continue chatting about Anakin, he responded. While his attitude would be of concern and his ideas that seemed to be somewhat antagonistic of the Jedi Code, I would say everything else is appropriate. Qui-Gon said. There should be nothing hindering Anakin from advancing other than smaller concerns like his age. Qui-Gon continued. We may want to wait a while yet before we suggest him being nominated. Mace said thinking about the timing of bringing up such a topic, in fact he was thinking about a perfect time to advance him considering his achievements. How long do you suggest we hold out for then? Qui-Gon asked seeing that Mace seemed to have a general idea of the timing. I think I know when we could promote him. Mace continued. Qui-Gon quirks an eyebrow. Do you wish to tell me of this special timing? I think for now, no. Mace had been growing his own mischievous streak because of being around Anakin so much influencing him. Welcome back. Barris called out to Anakin as he had entered the training room he and his small friend group used. Barris had come to learn about Anakin going on his first mission, soon after he had left, and was a little upset he did not tell her about it before he left. But this didn't stop her from being a bit overly excited at seeing him again. Anakin seeing whom was within the training room replied, I feel welcomed. Barris again just about smashes right into Anakin embracing him before stopping herself. Ahsoka who is also within the room, has no such reservation, and immediately leaps towards Anakin. 
latching onto his back sticking onto him purely through using the force. It would seem that being gone for a little over a week is too long. Ahsoka just nods her head behind him, while Barris just looks down a bit embarrassed. What have you two been up to then while I was away? Deciding to move the subject away in consideration for Barris. He asks a generic question. Ahsoka being very energetic responds first before Barris could try and reply. Nothing much, it was boring. The teachers would not let us have any fun. Mini Ahsoka seemed to be pouting. At least that is how Anakin imagined her behind his back. How mean of them, and you Barris. Anakin smoothly brings her back into the conversation so she doesn't feel left out. I didn't do nothing much, the teachers were okay. But I will have to agree with Ahsoka here. That most of what happens around is boring. Barris says honestly before quietly continuing. Especially without you here. Anakin can obviously hear this, and maybe even the little Togruta could as well. But he ignores that last part, and asks another question that was at front of his mind. By the way, where is Isla? Isla went on a mission as well, right after you had gone. Ahsoka's muffled voice comes from behind him as she was still holding on tightly to his back. Is that right? Anakin questions out loud while looking towards Barris for confirmation. Yes, Ahsoka is right. Barris replies while suspiciously looking him up and down. Anakin himself had started to notice his thoughts were starting to drift more and more when it came to Isla but he couldn't quite put his finger on the reason. Through the force he was obviously able to tell there was some sort of connection between himself and her, but he couldn't place it. Wait a second, haven't you grown even taller? Barris asks in slight annoyance. I want to grow up quicker as well. She had noticed that Anakin was much more interested in women older, or at the very least physically older looking, in considering their age. It was rather strange. She had been meaning to forcibly get Anakin checked for some type of medical condition, because of his unusual growth, since no one else had deemed it all too necessary to take an in-depth look at. If she could find out a way to replicate this effect, she may be able to grow up faster herself. I have been getting a lot of comments about that. I did not notice myself until it was pointed out to me. Anakin replied with a white lie. Barris decides to challenge Anakin's lie. Really? You? Aren't you quite perceptive? You are going to have to just take my word for it. Anakin replies with a small smirk. Whatever Smartus, I think it is time that we get some practice done. Ahsoka you get down from Anakin and only watch. Barris said with some heat in her tone. Seems like she needs to get something out of her system. I guess taking it out on me is the way. Anakin thought to himself before saying. I think you should sit this one out Ahsoka. It would seem Barris here wants to communicate with an act rather than her words. Okay. Ahsoka got down from Anakin and moved out of the area. Both got a training lightsaber so they could spar and duel with each other. The outcome of the fight doesn't matter, because Anakin was going to win no matter what. But that didn't mean Barris didn't want to get her point across. She disliked what had happened, and even her Jedi training wouldn't fully contain her emotions here. This emotional trait was something she shared with her counterpart as well which would have lead her to becoming swayed by the dark side. With Anakin here, she would be able to better control herself and have an anchor, with which she has used a lot to get through the mental pressure of trying to live up to certain Jedi expectations. What are you waiting for? Anakin still had the irritating smirk upon his very attractive face, at least within the eyes of Barris. No primal outcry was given just a swift dash towards her target, and the duel had begun. Using her preferred lightsaber combat form, Form 3, also known as Ceresu, the way of the Minoc, or the resilience form. Anakin decides to switch it up and only rely on defensive tactics, and imitates Obi-Wan's way of fighting. Patience, making sure that she runs out of energy while preserving his own. It would be the best way to deal with the current situation, as after she is done venting her emotions she would calm down and be ready for a proper talk. I am not sure what we would be talking about, but whatever it is it may very well get him in trouble. A woman's intuition was a scary thing after all, swearing within his mind but his face was ice, stone cold and immune to the inner musings going on within his mental psyche. Darth Sidious, otherwise publicly known as Sheev Palatine the Supreme Chancellor of the Republic, was not having a great day. In fact he was not having the best of weeks at all. He had been thwarted once again by those meddlesome Jedi. Not only the Jedi, but it would seem that one of the pawns in his plan, Skywalker was not going in the direction he wanted. Another thing to take into consideration was his now somewhat of an underdog of an opponent. The supposed military advisor and possibly the highest ranking person of Tatrayan's government, a man that goes by the name of Vader. My lord, a man asks in hesitance. Quiet. Sidious lashes out at the interruption of his inner monologue, not sparing the man that had done so. Screaming the man rides around on the ground in pain as electricity or lightning now courses through his veins, replacing his blood with Sidious standing above him in a display of dominance and power. Sidious was a patient man, a lot of his accomplishments would be a testament to such a fact. But that didn't mean he was immune to the petty thoughts he had when angered, and would need to unleash himself every once in a while, to keep a sane mind. The dark side of the force is indeed seductive, 
But that doesn't mean that it is only benefits. Just like everything within the galaxy he had learned everything had its price, and power like the power he had was fought for with tooth and nail. Subterfuge of course being his utmost tool to achieve his goals. But it would seem his tools were incapable of enabling him another victory even if could be considered small in the grand scheme of things to come. That didn't mean it wouldn't have helped speed up the process of his domination. My agent was captured and you are here blabbering on and on to me about these stupid low lifes. Sidious had just killed someone of not too great of importance. But questions would be raised about this person's disappearance. Something trivial enough for him to settle. The man had come in talking on and on about the disappearance of criminals within the underbelly of Coruscant. Why would he care? Their business is being overtaken by some unknown entity. Something as trivial as this. Why bother? It is of no interest to him considering he has a galaxy to conquer. To usurp for himself and make of his own. He is currently seated upon the greatest and most grandest of thrones. Even if it has not been fully achieved, the downfall of the Republic is quite certainly almost guaranteed. At least my current apprentice doesn't disappoint. Sidious thought about Count Dooku or what he goes by now as Darth Tyrannus. He may be a disappointment and would be replaced within the future. But that doesn't mean I cannot squeeze the usefulness out of him right now. Darth Tyrannus was always meant to be a pawn. No, a queen within a chessboard he is willing to sacrifice within the greater scheme of things. Speaking to his red guards, he orders them to take the dead official out. Get rid of this filth. They salute and readily take the guy away, with some fear being emanated from and felt through their emotions. Yes, fear me. He cackles within his mind. My plans are still going according to my design, but it would seem that it will be more difficult and take more time. Sidious wanted to complete things as fast as possible, and he didn't have much time on his plate. But he had been waiting for a long while now. Why wouldn't he wait a few more decades to rise up and have absolute control over the Republic? Within Coruscant there was a thriving underground of criminal activity that mostly went unnoticed by everyone. The lower levels weren't exactly a good place to be at all things considered, as lots of activity that would lead to one being in trouble took place down there. It is here that we would find Anakin having a nice stroll down the at the lower levels, with no disguise on looking to unwind for a bit. Having a break from the very tense situations and events he has passively and actively gotten into helps the mind. Even if what he wants to do would be considered illegal. At the lowest runs of Coruscant society, highly dangerous and illegal garbage pit races were conducted. And if he remembered correctly the original had come down here because of some excitement to participate in such an event. Unfortunately for the original he was interrupted before such a race could begin because of an assassin. What can I do for you? A greasy and dirty woman had asked as Anakin approached her with his robe and hood covering most of his defining features. I would like to get into one of your races, Anakin said while slightly changing his voice to be less recognizable. Name. The woman questioned as she was writing something down on a notebook rather than typed up on a device. Tetsaya Shiba. Anakin replied. Strange name for someone around these parts. Not very common. The woman tried to poke and prod with her words feigning disinterest. You are correct. Anakin said in a tone that left no room for curiosity. Right. Here you are then. She handed over a piece of paper that would be his ticket of participation. I thank you. Anakin turns and leaves still disguised because he does wish to participate. But he didn't go totally unnoticed. The same attacker that was meant to go after the original Anakin was around and awaiting to ambush him. He knew of this person's existence and would patiently wait. What Anakin was thinking about however was why the Trade Federation would still send an assassin after him. And the only conclusion he came to was that he had taken over their droids through purchasing the scraps from Naboo all the time ago. What petty bastards. If it was true, the race would take place the day after tomorrow, and he has some time to create his own race wings to do the event. Again he was not doing this for the money, but to unwind from everything that had happened. That was what he told himself anyway. But his greed demanded that he also take the wealth he would earn from such an event. 3. 2. 1. Fire. A voice was heard over a broken speaker but was clear enough for the participants of the race to know it was their time to start. This racing event was actually something that took place through the air, not on the ground, and would the people have their designed glider-like mechanics attached to their backs to allow flight? Relaxing midair, Anakin's multiple thought processes drift off into a short slumber, but that doesn't mean he is not doing other things. A few were making bets on the races taking place, so that he would make the most out of his free time. Even on your free time, you could be making a profit in some way. Generally you shouldn't really be doing this. But Anakin's mind was like a supercomputer able to do multiple things at once with the same output, speed and capacity all at once. Not to mention his mind is actually connected to a virtual machine that is semi-alive, further increasing his mental capabilities. What would he do? And would you look at that? The newcomer, named Tetsuya Shiba, has surpassed those within the lead. An announcer says because not much police traffic is seen at these garbage pits. The small gathering crowd of lower slums thieves, gamblers and pickpockets were usual participants, and were about to lose out on a lot of money. No one would elect to vote for some nobody to win first place after all. Unfortunately those who are earning to seek a fortune here, 
have to be careful not to draw anyone unwanted attention, because it could very well get you killed. What Anakin was doing would prompt someone into hitting the kill switch so to speak. Kill the man in first place, we can't be losing out on some money now. Some random thug organizer of the event said to a lackey, Yes boss, a random lackey replied. Back on the air lane specified for the race, Anakin started to notice some signals of danger. Nothing that would harm him but could annoy him or injure him a bit if he decided to ignore these signals. Trying to yell over the air someone says to Anakin, you have done it now outsider, prepare to die. He practically goes in for a kamikaze, diving in to commit a suicide attack. The people around these parts are either crazy, desperate or a mix of both. Anakin was dodging a few of those people coming after him. Funnily enough this wouldn't be the first time something like this had happened because there would always be those with the talent to succeed in something like this but be brought down by those who run the events. Thankfully Anakin is more than the underdog. He continues to dodge his pursuers throughout the race. Thankfully there are some rules in place to stop people from coming after someone immediately after the race finishes. You guys kind of suck. Anakin begins taunting them over the air. Shut up. Another dives in trying to take him out of the race. After a while, the race finally come to an end with a lot of casualties, a lot of losses. Most of all Anakin had made a massive profit, not really comparable to anything else he had made over the years. But Iz was sizable enough to satiate his greed. Anakin was aware of some shady figures following him, but he wasn't really concerned about those people. He would easily enough lose all of them, but there was one person in particular that he wanted to look into. Ditching everyone remaining invisible to everyone but one he walks into a separate alleyway. A simple mind trick changing the perception of everyone around you, but only doing so for those I choose. Instead of being interrupted before the race had started, Anakin had made sure he could still get his prize pool. And now that those matters were dealt with he could proceed to deal with his assassin. Night Cycle, Coruscant Underbelly. Key Dave was a male bloodcarver assassin. An orphan, Dave was adopted into the family of one of the last bloodcarver clans. The clan leader commanded Dave to take the son of his benefactor on a ritual ferrogriff hunt on one of Coruscant's moons, despite the fact it was prophesied he would die of a head wound. Dave accidentally killed the young blood carver with a stray shot to the head, for which he was exiled from his tribe, which led to him becoming an outlaw of sorts, which would result in his eventual work and employment to the Trade Federation, or more specifically some dissident members of said corporation. This lead him to his current position, his current target. With no chance to kill him during the race, he would only have to find a spot afterwards, with which he would leave the track. I could also take his winnings, being an orphan while also being employed and not paid as well as he could be. With no backing of course he would try to make money from any source he could get. If there was one thing Dave was thankful for was that he had no family to take care of. This type of responsibility would only increase his worries and troubles to his already dangerous lifestyle. After the pit race he trailed his target for a while, waiting for his other greedy pursuers to leave him alone. Funnily enough no one noticed that Anakin was just going in circles with no place to go to, greed blinding them. Dave was no different, except that he was able to notice this suspicious activity, even though it didn't raise too many alarm bells. This could at least tell him that Anakin was prepared for any would-be attacker. He knows of the Jedi and wouldn't be surprised if he was able to tell, with their space magic and all. To save some time, Dave started to kill off some of his competitors in the hunt, which he didn't notice was unnoticed at some point, but continued to do so anyway. With being the only one left, he was ready to claim his prize, and thankfully it was night time, the perfect time to strike. Walking behind the supposed unsuspecting Jedi, Dave was ready to blast him. It was dark, and the night cycle of Coruscant wasn't exactly quiet or even had no visible light to illuminate the various areas throughout. In fact Coruscant could be best described as an unsleeping city. Dave was not stupid and was not misinformed, so he had come prepared to fight his target to the death, knowing full well the potential of his death. He has nothing to live for anyway. So what did it matter to him? Coming in, this is Team Alpha Leader, target is confirmed alone and potentially armed. Dave spoke through a device very quietly far enough away, so he would not be heard by the Jedi Padawan. Team Beta Leader over, is the target far from any potential help? Someone responded, another one of his teammates hired for this mission. It wasn't Dave alone here to take care of his target because there was a lot of unknowns about his capabilities. In general as a rule, force sensitives should be taken seriously, but not everyone followed this principle. What do we have to worry over a Padawan? Someone had said over the transmission device. Shut it. This channel should only be used for the mission, stop unnecessary chatter. Team Beta Leader reprimanded the subordinate unit mocking Anakin's capabilities underestimating his power. Everyone had started to move in on the location of their target, setting up in various areas. What is the Jedi doing? One random subordinate asked seeing that Anakin was just walking around every now and then, and stopped after a while before continuing his pacing. 
I don't know, want to go up to him and ask. A random subordinate replied with some snark over the comlink. Dave responded over the comlink. Maybe all that the Jedi teach mushes someone's brain. I am sure the Jedi are quite stupid, sitting up their ivory tower. Envious life they live while we have to take on such dangerous missions like this just to live. A random subordinate said. After a while which may have been no more than a few minutes for everyone to arrive and get into positions, Dave decided to take point. I will be giving the orders here, Roger. Everyone within the two teams assigned to take care of Anakin replied, and now that teams Alpha and Beta were ready, they awaited their orders to fire. On my go. Anticipation was being built up as none had ever experienced hunting down a Force sensitive before, especially one that had been trained to use their abilities. Go. Blaster fire came from near all directions, as it would be suicide to engage while in a crossfire from your own team members. A good part of the building Anakin was stopped, had been destroyed in rubble, and been piling up with a large cloud of dust covering their view. They didn't stop though, not until they were safe and secure in the knowledge they had completed their mission. Not until their alpha leader gave the command to stop. Alright, stop. The order was given, but a few members hyped on adrenaline and fear, either did not hear the command, or decided to ignore it, and continue firing due to fear. A shout was heard from the comlink connecting them all together, stop. After a small bit of delay, everyone had decisively halted their non-stop hail of blaster fire. The lighting had been destroyed, now making it darker than it was before, further hindering the assassin's vision. Where is he? Is he dead? I don't know, someone go check. No one was willing to go in and be potential killed, but one cocky fellow decided that they had the biggest balls. I will do it. Since you pansies don't have the guts to dash he is cut off as he went further into the dust cloud. The sound of his voice echoed out, and then there was silence. You think he is playing some sort of prank on us? I don't think this is the right time for that within the darkness. They could see a writhing mass of pitch black ink. It was darkness within darkness, but was prominent enough for their minds to register the danger this thing, this monster held. Run for it. They started firing again in panic trying to escape the monster. But Anakin wasn't having any of it. His force lightning was being emitted from the black hole originating from him, and the electricity currents were starting to crawl across the ground at speeds faster. Then their eyes could see it and coil around their bodies, instantaneously burning them alive from the inside out. Where do you think you are going? Pulling inwards, Anakin uses the force to make sure they stayed within his vicinity, so he could finish them all. He had one in particular he would keep alive for a short time though. Please, spare me. I needed the money. Someone's pleas and cries for mercy were only absorbed by the approaching darkness. No one would hear them anyway, Anakin had made sure of that. He wasn't just walking around and pacing back and forth for nothing. After everyone had been slaughtered, all but one did Anakin led up on his very corrupting dark side abilities. Thus giving birth to a shining bright light that Dave thought he would never see again. You have been a very naughty insect. Anakin approached the insectoid alien. Look into my eyes. Mesmerizing the being Anakin plundered everything he wanted and decided to put the poor bastard out of his misery. I don't regret killing you. Unlike the original, having dealt with his business down below, Anakin felt it was time to check up on John Doe. Walking within the Jedi's medical bay located inside the temple, Anakin spots the current head of the medical department, Rignima. A female Halasi, Rignima is a consular Jedi who served as a doctor at the Jedi Temple on Coruscant. Not strong enough or talented enough to be granted the ability to become a proper or fully fledged Jedi. But capable in her own right, she was a part of the medical corps. She has what most would consider, within the Order, the most important job. Looking after the Jedi whom had become Jedi Knights and above. Of course she does other things as well. But that was seen as the most important. Dr. Nima. Anakin said greeting the doctor. Looking her over Anakin could outline some of her more striking features. Golden eyes and yellow skin. Something that is standard to her species. A bit surprised at not sensing his presence she responds. Padawan Skywalker. You have startled me. I just about had a heart attack. Anakin responded. I didn't think you would be so weak. Weak. I will have you know that despite my failings. I think I could teach you a thing or two. Rig replied. Anakin decides to brush off her comment and walk towards John Doe. How is John Doe doing? You came here just to check up on the subject. She questioned with incredulity. Yes. Anakin had no time for Ho he means had no time for the doctor. She rolls her eyes and continues. Well, from what I could gather and analyze with the equipment here, it would seem that he had been poisoned by some unknown substance. I know that already. Anakin replies in jest. But she takes it as an insult to her intelligence. Shut it smartest. She replies with snark. Whatever you say. Anakin responds while looking at her weirdly for her comeback. Before turning back to observe John Doe. They both become silent just going about their own tasks. While Rig was going about her own things to do as she had to do much more. Then sit around the subject that was brought in. Anakin was just stewing within one of his thought processes. Thinking about why this could have happened. The poison in on itself was easily identified to be poisonous. 
but his mental state was deteriorating just before. The only thing he could link that back up to was his mental wipe. Going into the mind of this guy and carefully removing any memory of him doing things outside of an edited truth by him was necessary. But it would seem that it was what had caused his mind to shut down further. It may even be why he went into a comatose state not as a result of the self-poisoning, but because of his mental probing. Padawan Skywalker. A voice was heard but was not registered, as it would seem that Anakin was within another place. Skywalker. Anakin was actually using his multiple thoughts to go over and reconstruct his ability to go into the minds of others because of its harm. At basic telepathic abilities most Force sensitives have, they gain stuff like thought and emotion sensing. But what Anakin had developed was very close to a dark side force ability created by a Sith. In the process he was trying to make it more centered, more balanced. He doesn't want to absolutely destroy the minds of those he tries to enter because of the power or the lack of control, and would like to keep their mental state intact. It would be a useful ability to have in the future if he could nail this down, and perfect it at its core. Now waving her hand in front of his face, Dr. Rig Nima could clearly see that he seemed to be lost in thought. He may even be meditating. How the hell did he do that? The rumors going around about his supposed capabilities must be true. Rig thought to herself. On record he had been stated that Anakin's midi-chlorian account was undocumented. Padawan Skywalker. She reaches forwards to touch his face, but is shocked to find that an apparent substance had manifested covering the area she was about to touch. What is that? She was within her thoughts at the exposure, while Anakin was brought out from his trance-like state, interrupting his progress. Keeping a neutral face and suppressing his feelings of annoyance, he politely asked the doctor. Yes, doctor. Not interested in whatever trance-like state he was in, she was now much more interested in this mysterious protective shell that quickly acted as soon as her touch came to close. What was that? What was what? Anakin obviously goes through the environment's history using psychometry to retrace her steps, and finds she had inadvertently come across his nano suit. But that is already public. Well, at least public to those in the nose knowledge. You know what? That substance, that material that was just surrounding your cheek there. She points it out and even goes in for another touch, but is again surprised to find that there is nothing there. No response. I don't know what you're talking about. But what I am interested in however is the scans taken from the analyzers. Anakin redirects the subject, and it seems to work for now. Interested but not overly so, Rig says. I can give you access. But how are you going to understand all of the medical mumbo jumbo anyway? I have some interesting friends. Anakin answers with some mystery, unintentionally. And who would they be? Rig seems to become more and more invested in Anakin as time passes. Anakin responds. You're quite nosy aren't you? My job demands it. Rig replies with some amount of pride in her work. Rig was drawn to the mystery of Anakin Skywalker, just as many other females no doubt were drawn by. Sometimes interest comes from the very fact someone knows next to nothing about you, and would only want to know you more, if only to know your juicy secrets even if they aren't. Rig gets back to her work after fulfilling Anakin's request for the proper medical documents, as she is a doctor, and doctors don't get the best of sleep. In fact Dr. Rig Nima had some other patients she had to get to, considering the high injury rates one would think more come to here. But it would seem that the Jedi really did not get into as much trouble as they have, or they were simply being protected from any danger that comes their way. The Force does have some control over the fate of the people after all. Like Mother Nature trying to better evolve and make sure a certain balance is kept in place, the Force does the same, but only in response to the energies of the dark and light. Why else would it go ahead and have someone create an entire prophecy in regards to restoring the balance? Master Shakti. Anakin questioned as he felt a presence approaching his training room, or what had become known as his training room. Not that he didn't like having a private room for himself and friends, but it was a little detrimental when he had to explain he didn't actually think he owned it, and it had only become like that because of his droid storage. Of course he had moved most of his droid into underneath the Jedi Temple, housed within the hidden Sith Temple, but he is not going to tell anyone that. No knock was given as the solitary Jedi Master entered the room. Padawan Skywalker. Shark greeted him, Master T. He gave the standard Jedi reply, waiting to see what she was doing here. There was awkward silence as she didn't continue and just stood there. Are you here for something? Or Shark breaks from whatever mind fog she had and continued. Yes. Yes. I am here to have a little conversation. About. Anakin asks. It is about my new apprentice. I plan to take her away on a trip to my home planet of Shiley. But I have grown to understand that my solitude seems to have contributed somewhat to my first Padawan's death. Shark T admits to Anakin while they were alone. I won't say about how you were in the wrong or anything about that. Your mistakes are to be learnt yourself, and not from me telling you about them. Anakin replied thinking she came to him for some kind of advice. I didn't come here for your advice Padawan. Shark puts some emphasis on the Padawan word at the end. Of course. Anakin said then continued by questioning. Then what are you here for? What is it you Padawan needs that you have come here to me? My shortcomings. Whatever they may be are something I will have to deal with. 
but I do not want another of my apprentices dying because of it. Shark was coming clean to Anakin, and he was confused as to why. I know that is strange for a Jedi Master to come to a Padawan for some assistance, but you are the only person I have come to befriend within the Order, so I am your only close friend. Anakin asks the older woman with some incredulity, seemingly keeping in whatever embarrassment at that statement, she said. Yes, she admits readily. Okay. Anakin doesn't hesitate to agree. I will be your friend. T smiles for a bit, giving off her signature of putting smile. That would scare some people off, which was in part the reason to her not being very close to anyone. Not even her previous apprentice had she been all that close to. So what is it that you would like some help with? Anakin asked for what was the third time he had said to her. Right, right. Sorry about that, my apprentice, as you know, has only graduated. But because of my shortcomings, I have come to you. Shark T said then continued. When it comes to combat, I am aware that I may not be the best teacher. But I have heard that you have been helping some younglings, students and others with lightsaber combat. Shark continued. I have also heard that your training consists of more than the usual lightsaber combat and form training, but of other things as well. Yes, that is true. But I don't just teach everyone, and for now help my friends and those I have become well acquainted with. Anakin replied that continued. You must have also heard I take over some lessons for younglings every now and then. Shark chuckles a bit before saying. Your punishment, right? Anakin sighs out loud and replies. Yes. My punishment. Shark T then continues. Will you accept her? Sure. I see no problem with helping a friend. Anakin replies. Thank you. She smiles. No problem. Anakin just nods back. After his encounter with Shark T, he had been dragged along by her to meet her new apprentice, yet again. He had already seen her and didn't need to be reintroduced. But Shark in her excitement, had still done so. I guess she really doesn't want to repeat. Anakin thought to himself. Arnie. Little Ahsoka said trying to get his attention while Barris was practicing against some droids. She had taken a liking to calling him by that nickname, and it seemed like everyone else liked using it as well. Well, most females he had some sort of friendship, had taken a liking to using this pet name. Yes, Ahsoka. Anakin replied. Can you help me? Ahsoka questions him with some hints of pleading. She was growing up and starting to develop some more. Her mind, her emotions and the maturity of them. Ahsoka was still a child within Anakin's eyes, but she had been putting in an effort to seem more adult-like. Every child wants to be an adult, while every adult wants to go back to being a child. I mean why wouldn't they? Children basically have next to no worries and concerns, but they seemed like that was the only thing in their eyes to become. What is it that you need help with? Anakin asked. Ahsoka then went on to explain that she was having some trouble meditating, just as most children do, and that a few would be capable of being calm enough to do so. Anakin doesn't blame the children for their desire to get up and do more, it was within their nature. Wait, trying to practice meditation right now would be pretty good. Anakin thought to himself. Barris was making noise, but it wasn't so much that it would detract from the experience, and Ahsoka needed a starting place. When it came to things that could take you out of a meditative state, not that Anakin could complain, his mental fortitude had been trained rigorously, and he multiple thought processes, basically allowing him to meditate forever with one of them. Being in a constant state of deep in-depth mental retreat while at the same time not was an interesting experience. It did help to improve his abilities overall, because being like this helps him immensely. The basics of Jedi meditation were to focus on whatever emotions were uppermost in one's mind to be honest with oneself about the feelings one experienced and their effects. Then, one was to let each emotion go the goal being to make oneself an empty vessel, that the Force would be able to fill with peace and serenity. On the other hand, whereas the Jedi meditated to quiet their minds and connect with the Force, Sith Lords meditated to concentrate their anger, their fear, and their hatred into a pure point of ruthless power within them. At least that was the Jedi and Sith ways, and was something trying to be taught to Ahsoka. I believe it would be best to help her with my own version. As meditation was to have a stronger and more direct connection with the Force, it could sometimes affect one's surroundings without the practitioner's conscious control, usually causing surrounding objects, or even the practitioner themselves to levitate. Again something that Anakin didn't have to worry about because he had complete conscious control. Alright, I think we will start with. Anakin then went on to practice with Ahsoka some meditation, but what he was trying to teach her was not the way of the Jedi or the Sith, but his own way. Focus on whatever emotions were uppermost in one's mind to be honest with oneself about the feelings one experienced and their effects. Do not let go and do not make yourself to be a vessel for the Force. Anakin was against leaving your entire fate and destiny to a semi-sentient energy like the Force. Use those emotions, whatever they may be to help empower yourself in a controlled manner. Controlling the direction of these emotions and not being controlled by them. After a while the two would finish their first meditative session together with Ahsoka actually managing to do so. Cloning was the process of duplicating an organism into one or many genetically identical individuals known as clones. An army of clone troopers is being grown on the planet Kamino and Anakin 
Anakin wants in. Well, what he means when he wants in is to be able to get some sway and interfere with the project. Using the human Mandalorian bounty hunter Jango Fett as a template, the Kaminans tampered with Fett's genetic structure to make his clones more docile. In addition, they were designed to grow at twice the rate of normal human aging, making the clone troopers ready for deployment in a decade's time. At this point of time, the clones would only be about three years of age. But considering their accelerated growth process, they would be about six years of age currently. Which would mean that Anakin was way past the point of being able to interfere with the process to the extent that he wanted. But that doesn't mean he would be incapable of trying to fix the problem with their brains. When it comes to his longtime companion power, Mekuderu, it wasn't has been shown to be capable enough of extending its helping hand. Unfortunately, it would not be able to influence the created chip within the clones. Simply because the chip, even though based off of technology and normal stuff like that, it was only indirectly so, and in on itself was made up of biological matter. Meaning Meku Deru would be near useless for the already created clones. Anakin would take control of the facilities in the future, so when the new clones were developing, he would be able to usurp the process. But right now it would be too late. What he would have to do is fully take over the process, and then do a medical re-examining of their biological chips, and remove them, so that they could be free. He would be unable and is unable to do this considering his resources right now are already stretching it thin. Even if he had enough military might to occupy Kamino, that doesn't mean it would be good for him either because of his current relationship with them. Kamino and Tatooine were quite close together, so Anakin could have taken a short trip over or with systems to stealthily take over their facilities. But that wouldn't get him anywhere with the current clones. His time was also limited before he had to return to Coruscant. This didn't mean he was unwilling to go and would take the opportunity to just in case redirect the genetic programming done by the Kaminans. Anakin was within his room, but wanted to head down to his renovated Sith temple beneath, because it was much more secure. So he made his way down there so he could establish a connection while posing as Vader, because that was how he represented himself to the Kaminans. Now suited up he was ready to call in about some of his requests. Waiting. The Kaminan he was most in touch with responded because he had made sure to not deal with the head medical chief of their people. Lama Su was a good enough replacement in that regard. But while Anakin's projects were worked on he needed someone to supervise the situation. Who better than his living medical droids, of course not all of them, but some had gone over with top of the line knowledge. And now they have only gotten better with their experience, which also translated to Anakin becoming better with science overall as well. What can I do for you? Lama Su said as they were viewing each other through screens. I wish to know of the progress of the Sky Seed. Why, of course. Lama Su was ready and very, very willing to be connected to Vader. He had caught up on the politics of the galaxy a bit recently, and was surprised to find that Vader was somewhat connected to the Skywalker family in Tatooine. Considering their proximity to each other, it would be most beneficial to have a nice relationship, not taking into account that Tatooine had somehow gone against the hearts and one. This was more than enough reason for Lama to make sure they had a positive mutual friendship. While Nullacy, their chief medical scientist of Kamino was doing well with the clones that didn't make they were totally secure in their financial outlook. With options, they could afford a mistake or two. We have developed the next two implants, and they would be ready when you need them. Lama Su said, but was curious about something else and continued. I am interested though, the cells you have sent are of a human sample, correct? That is correct, Vader replied. I have taken to conducting some extra tests on this sample, and what I had found was amazing. It is nothing of which I have never seen before, Lama said. What of it? Vader again replied, but didn't seem to mind Lama's curiosity. I was interested in the genetic makeup, and it is of the standard human genetics. But there was something more. The midi-chlorians, something which we have grown prone to testing for due to certain reasons. And I must say that this was surprising. Lama said. Lama continued. We needed to create device capable enough to measure it, and the count per cell exceeding my expectations, and those who were also looking into it. Using these cells in combination of those implants, we have theorized and hypothesized that it would be capable enough to uplift someone else's count per cell, simply because of its overwhelming amount. That is interesting. Vader replied with a bland tone but was actually interested himself as this could spell the creation of a force-sensitive army of people if used correctly. Remembering his synthetic beings and that he wanted the droids to transfer consciousness into a proper biological body, but to so after having the bodies evolve and adapt with the Sky Seed implants, he couldn't be any more happy at this revelation. This would mean that they would not lose out on retaining their ability to use the Force, and it would not be in direct violation of the rules the Force so heavily reinforces. It had backlashed on Plagueis trying to use the dark side of the Force in another way it didn't like, so it created him, supposedly. But through this way, it is of a tried method before. An example dating back to those crazy enough to try and increase another being's Force sensitivity through blood transfusions, and it worked with minimal success. This would be no different in principle, 
but may have a much greater and more profound effect. Vader decides to question about the sense and the rate of their completion. How soon do you think we can finish the complete graph and set of sky seed implants? Well, given that there are a grand total of 19, and we have completed the first five, it would seem that we will be ready in no time for every stage, with extra time to spare. Lama answered, in fact we have already started work on the next implants. How long until I can use these next two then? Vader asked. Well, for the human child going through this, it would need to be between the ages of 12 to 13 for one and 12 to 14 for the other. So there are some limits or time constraints to these amazing genetic discoveries. A reason why these implants could actually work was because the humans of this universe have great genetic malleability. One of the reasons the Kaminans decided it was fine cloning humans instead of any other species was exactly because of this. You are aware of the sense and what I wish to do with them, Vader said in a questioning tone. Yes, I think I know where you are going with this, and I have already confirmed that it is possibly to use the implants on the synthetics. Lama Su responded. I have another thing to report though. I need to send into a few other cellular sample, because the old ones would be considered old. Vader continued. Old? I don't believe that applies here. Lama tried to correct Vader. Vader responds. I do believe it does, considering since the last time a sample was delivered one key factor has changed from the original sample. And what would that be? Lama asked with some interest. The midi chlorine counts have changed. In fact it has increased by a substantial amount and I would like you to use the new cells available. Lama's eyes widen enough for Vader to make out the difference through the screen, separating the both of them. Really, that should be impossible. How did this happen? Let's just say that some interesting events had taken place to allow for something like this. By how much did it increase since last time? The sample we have here, we were able to create a machine to specifically test the count per cell, and it read at 36,900. How much higher could it possibly go? Lama was very excited at this prospective discovery. Take that number and increase it by a third. Vader responded with some amusement in his modulated voice. 49,200. Lama was still recovering from the shock of such a thing, but then noticed a little discrepancy. How did you figure this out? I have technology of my own to do advanced medical diagnosis. And do you also not remember my medical droids I had sent over? Vader answered. Of course. How could I forget that? But to have a midi-chlorine count so high, the genetics of this person, or more like the cellular structure of this being, must have a great capacity to hold all of those extra microorganisms. Lama was now starting to rant because even though he is the current leader of the Kaminans, that doesn't mean he is also not interested in more scientific matters. It is something that is deep-rooted in their society. Lama continues, send over this sample as soon as possible. I would very much look to investigate how exactly this human cells are stable enough and have such an unlimited capacity for all of that. Right away, I will get it done and I would like for you to fashion the next two implants using this updated sample as well. Vader replied with a request. Why, of course. Lama readily agreed. The rest of the conversation between the two would include some medical examinations and explanations that most without some degree in the sciences wouldn't understand. Especially when it came to genetics, biology and a lot of other stuff when it came to designing his synthetic army to be. The plan was to introduce a new piece of consciousness and force sensitivity suppression technology that would stop the growing bodies from developing their own souls or consciousness. This would allow for Anakin to proceed with the transfer process without having to kill off another soul. The problems however with the accelerated aging process would be the same as with the clones and Anakin, his living medical droids and all the Kaminans would have to find a way around this. For now, everything has been proceeding to plan. Anakin thought to himself after dealing with the very antisocial and distant Kaminans. Within another month or so, I should have the two next implants to further along the development of my body. The first three were starting to have dramatic effects, increasing his physical capabilities overall, but other parts would be needed to complete the process. Thankfully his healing factor was by far the most advanced out of any person alive, considering his nano suit, force healing abilities, reinforced dark and light side magics, influence physique and medical technology. There would be next to nothing to worry about when it came to hiding the results. Given his lustful nature that had become more pronounced, Anakin was slightly surprised and not at the same time, because of his resilience to the pull of natural urges. It would seem that his lasting this long would finally come to an end today. The House of Virtue, a sign was read within his mind as he had finally decided to put an end to his 12-year-long abstinence. It was involuntary of course because what were you to do with a part that didn't work because you hadn't started to hit puberty yet. He wasn't a playboy within his previous life for nothing after all. So he headed in with no hesitation. Why? Hello there handsome. A Twi'lek woman walks by giving Anakin a good look at the goods and winking towards him. Anakin had hidden his features by projecting the force and masking his face with another, a fake face crafted to make sure others didn't know he came here. It wouldn't look good for his image as a Jedi, now would it? And he especially gaining traction now with some fame. Walking towards a counter, Anakin decides to get straight to business. I would like to procure some services. 
Anything for the right amount, the woman behind the counter replied, of course. Anakin then paid for the services to come, and he had a feeling that he may last a very long time, considering all the enhancements done to his body. He wouldn't be surprised. What would happen was a few working women would come along with Anakin to a privately selected room where a lot of fun would happen, and an entire night would pass by, as Anakin had to rediscover himself, rediscover and work on some skills that may have atrophied over the long years. Thankfully it wouldn't take too long for him to finish up. Well it did, but what he had meant by finish up, is that the working women that had come along for the ride were worn out, tired from the action and wouldn't go on any longer. Walking from outside the private room, Anakin starts to walk away from the interesting business. Wait, a sleepy and very sexy looking Twi'lek followed after him. Will you be coming another time? Considering that Anakin was only here to satiate his lust, he would probably come again if not to another establishment but he answered another way. No, he didn't want to build up any hopes of starting some kind of relationship. They may be people as well, but Anakin was not looking to get involved with them and would only do so as one-offs. The Twi'lek seemed to be visibly disappointed because she had a great time, better than all of the customers she had interacted with before. Please reconsider. She tried to be as seductive as possible, and it might have worked for some other men, but Anakin was not interested. He just walked off and disappeared as the son of Coruscant was starting to rise. Within the Jedi High Council's conference room, I have heard of some interesting rumors that may hold some truth to them. Shark T spoke within an average council meeting. Pray tell. What might these rumors be? Mace questions the reclusive Jedi Master. It is about our enigmatic Jedi Padawan, Anakin Skywalker, and I am sure that those of us here have also heard of the things said around the temple. In fact within the Senate itself, Shark continued after Mace's questioning. Aware I am of young Skywalker's political intrigue. Yoda responds here. And of you. Master Windu. Yes, I am also aware of Skywalker's proposal, Mace responds. Proposal, has Padawan Skywalker created some more trouble for us now? Kai Adi Mundi asked. Shark T responded in Anakin's defense. No well yes and no. It is more of the result of his new given position of being a part of a royal family and government. That doesn't conform to the Jedi or the Republic. Shark continued. This has resulted in a most interesting proposal. Jedi Master Deba Balaba. The current youngest on the council questioned. And what is this proposal, if I may ask? From what I was able to ascertain, the boy has somehow gotten himself into some sort of political marriage contract. Shark T answers with her little bit of knowledge on the subject. The council grows silent at this subject. The Jedi do not allow attachments, yes, and usually condemn a lot of emotions because of their fear of the dark side of the Force. But that doesn't mean exceptions were not made. In fact the Jedi did not allow someone to be married. This goes against their beliefs completely putting Anakin, or more like his home planet of Tatooine at old with the Jedi. This subject was also meant to be secret, something Anakin's mother had told him in privacy on Tatooine. But it would seem somehow leaks were provided. This piece of information while not too damaging at all, definitely would put Anakin in a tight spot if the Jedi believed him to somehow be involved. They do not have the best track record when it comes to investigations and Ahsoka from alternate timeline would have left the order because of this. One such exception to the rule that applied to this situation was Kai Adi Mundi, who at this current time has five wives and around six to seven children with possibly more on the way. Why? Because he was a Serian. One only had to look at the current species situation. Serians were a sexually dimorphic species, with male Serians aging more rapidly than their female counterparts. Additionally, males were outnumbered by females, due to a skewed birth rate ratio of 20 females to every one male. This is what had allowed the slightly sociopathic Jedi Master, Kai Adi Mundi to have as many wives as he did. The council were conflicted about the situation because once again they were forced to see the situation again. What is the problem exactly here? Does Padawan Skywalker need to have children? Kai Adi Mundi asked feeling that the boy was somewhat similar to himself in this instance. Well, if we are to take into account the information we have gathered here, then it is only plausible that he would need to do so, Plo Koon said. Young Padawan Skywalker, no matter if he is the chosen one or not, now has responsibilities he cannot turn down. Plo Koon continued, he is now a prince of some kind on some outer rim world. Politics are not the most straightforward of things, and require some reluctant agreements. The Jedi are not above the rulings of the Senate even when we have our own freedoms. Mace said, Master Windu correct he is. Padawan Skywalker's situation more pondering, deliberation it needs. Judge the situation must be before decide we must before against our wishes the decision chosen is. Yoda said to the council as this would be the last of their conversation for now. Padm was fast approaching her self-imposed term limits now, but that didn't mean she would escape her supposed fate brought down upon her by multiple people. Not only from within her own people, but also from the Senate. She would not have been so opposed to this decision if it was her choice. But it would seem that she has very little control over a decision such as this. Especially when everyone was up against you. At least it is to someone I know and quite like Padm thought to herself, before having a light dusting of red on her checks. 
and shaking off those thoughts, continues with her activities. Having talked to his mother, Padden had come to the conclusion that an alliance was needed if not wanted by her as selfish as it may be. She still had valid reasons to do as such, they just aligned with her own preferences. Your Highness, if I may. A counselor within the assembly room spoke to her askance of an audience. What is it? Padm asked. She went on to discuss with the advisors and people in positions of power within the hierarchy of her people, which lead to solving problems for her people, the people she represents and tries to uplift. With one year left, she doesn't have too much time to implement the changes she wants. Her plans for the future right now included trying to become a part of the Senate to take the place of the original representative of her planet. While Palpatine had become the Supreme Chancellor that left his previous position open, and she was planning to take it for herself. It would seem, however, that she may not be able to do so and would have to become a part of another government to another government on a planet she doesn't all too much like. Don't get her wrong, she doesn't dislike the people, it is the heat on Tatooine that she is unused to. She was currently alone and had been talking to her elder sister about the recent events and her apparent fate. Her sister who had no desire to serve in the government of which she was a part of. I told you so. Patton's sister, Solana Berry, said to her over the connection they shared through a communication device. Sighing Patton responds. Yes, you don't have to be childish about it. Deciding to be mature Solar continues. So you have a new suitor then. Aren't you just happy that those within the Republic and your own people want you to go through with this? Not really. I would like to have made this decision by myself. Thank you. Padden says in exasperation. Is this guy unsuitable? Wait, if I remember correctly he should be around 5 years younger. Then you are. Sola replies with a questioning tone. Yes, that is correct. Padma answers. And that he had helped us out. Helped Nabu and her people out with funding. Sola continues. It was not like we couldn't deal with the situation ourselves. And his purpose was more than to be compassionate. Because he made some profit out of it. Padden responds to Sola's quick fire. Still, doesn't that kind of send a bad message against the Trade Federation? Are they still not around? Sola says. We can't blame the leadership for the entirety of the Trade Federation's wrongdoing. But the relations between the two parties are strained. Padden responds diplomatically even if she still has some anger over what had been done. After a while of continuous chat between the two as Padden does not see her family all too much because of her responsibilities. It doesn't mean she would be stuck unable to do something. Every now and then the topic would back around to her betrothal. Only time would tell whether or not the alliance between both planets go through. Considering all the factors however it is very much possible that both parties will accept. On the side of Nabu, they are in need of some allies, willing to help them ink his hard times before them. It had become quite obvious to them that the Republic is not quite all there right now, and it would not be best to rely too heavily on them. So alliances made with others may be a way to go, and a traditional way to confirm one such alliance is the intermarriage between two royalty. Even if on Nabu royalty doesn't work the same way, Padme is still a part of a noble-like house on Nabu. For Tatrain, they would accept because they are also in need of some allies, and while the Nabu, a peaceful people they are, are not the best of options they are relatively close to them. The royalty of Tatrine, really the two people of the royalty have in fact a relation with Pad making this deal even better. Another reason Tatrine would consider and accept is the need for a larger Skullwalker dynasty. Their numbers are simply too low, with only Shmai who is getting along in her years, and quite possibly will be unable to have another child within the next few years, and Anakin. Anakin whom had joined the Jedi who do not accept things like marriage, but thankfully exceptions to the rule still apply and makes this possible. Otherwise, there would be no mention of such a treaty. The possibility exists so why not try? Underneath the Jedi Temple, Anakin had been waiting in anticipation and excitement for the shipments that would arrive from Kamino. The implants were special and had to be kept in a contained environment, so safety was placed above everything else when transporting these items. First it would come from Kamino and then be transported to Tatooine. Then from Tatooine the implants would travel to Coruscant and be dropped off with the owned building under Skywalker Industries. After this Anakin would send some droids he has within the temple to escort them towards him within the temple, but this would be done so quietly and without the notice of the Jedi. The Jedi may not exactly be against genetic modification, but that doesn't mean they would be for it either. So Anakin had to take some precautions when it came to it. Entering the underground base set up by Anakin, his droids come in with a large package that contains the next two set of implants. My Emperor, your divine seed has arrived. The droid that was the head of the transportation said, Why does that sound so weird? Anakin thought to himself, Okay, thank you for your hard work. I think you can go back to whatever you were doing before. I can handle it from here on out. Of course, my Emperor. I would never doubt you. Your enthusiasm is much appreciated. 
but I would like to do this as soon as possible. Just like last time with the first three implants, Anakin had created a window of opportunity for himself to do so, and not make himself look suspicious after it. Anakin moves over with the medical droids to another part of the underground renovated temple and base, to where he had done the surgery before. Let us begin the operation. Laying down, Anakin is undressed to a point he is near stark naked. The medical droids get into position while Anakin mentally prepares himself for some pain yet again, lowering the nano suit's defensive capabilities, and allowing for the medical tools to penetrate his skin. Anakin goes over the first implant within his head. The hemastomon is the fourth of the 19 sky seed organs that is going to be implanted into himself. Once implanted into a main blood vessel like the aorta, femoral artery or the vena cava, the hemastomon will alter his blood's biochemical composition to carry oxygen and nutrients more efficiently. The actions of the hemastomon will turn Anakin's blood a brighter shade of red than that of normal humans because of its greatly increased oxygen carrying capacity. It also acts to biochemically regulate the actions of the second and third gene seed implants, the osmodular and biscopy, meaning when regulating the other implanted organs from before it will stop overgrowth and disorganize biochemicals that may lead to very bad results. The second implant of the to be introduced is next. The Laramans organ is the fifth of the 19 sky seed organs that are implanted into himself. Shaped like the human liver but only the size of a golf ball. This gene seed organ is placed within the chest cavity and manufactures the synthetic biological cells known as Laraman cells that were named after one of the researchers from the Sith Empire on Coruscant long ago. These biosynthetic cells serve the same physiological purpose for Anakin as it does for the normal human body's platelets, serving to clot the blood loss from wounds, but act faster, more efficiently and more effectively. When Anakin is wounded and blood loss incurs, Laramin cells are released by his circulatory system, attached to the body's normal leukocytes, white blood cells. At the site of the injury, they form scar tissue in a matter of seconds, effectively preventing massive blood loss and infection of the wound. It is hypothesized by the Kaminans that the action of this organ will be one of the reasons that Anakin would be seen as nearly invincible, and so difficult to kill, despite the terrible wounds he could sometimes endure. In general Anakin would not like to test such a thing, but because of this implant along with other factors, he could definitely see how fast his natural healing factor would trump a lot of beings. Add that in with the Force, and he reckons he has quite the invincibility, not immortality, as that would imply he could never age. Anakin still doesn't to achieve something like biological immortality. He has some plans of his own. For now however, he would make sure with being able to regenerate from grievous wounds, and maybe even able to reattach his limbs, if they ever get cut off. This would negate him from ever actually losing a hand. He wouldn't need to get a replacement if it comes down to it. And that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd seriously love it if you guys could leave a like on the video as it genuinely helps out so much, and it keeps me going, plus it takes only one second. That said, have a wonderful day. See you in the next one.